All right. Thank you all for coming back for a, a third session of this trilogy within a broader symposium on storytelling, myth making, and universal history. Of course, as you all know, this originally began as an intended singular class, um, which was going to focus on two challenges that I set for myself. One, to get across the, um, the nature of the insepid, poisonous, rotten set of ideas that have latched onto humanity and are currently trying to steer us into a controlled uh, storm in order to come out with a great reset and an entire new, um, I don't, and I won't say new, but I'll say a, a, a completely different paradigm of human relations, human society, human values, which has no bearing in how human beings actually um, were designed, what purpose we were designed to play, what makes us happy, what our true nature is. This is a completely um, ivory tower dystopic view, which is in complete antagonist, uh, it's an antithesis to natural law, common sense and morality. Um, I want to get a sense of where this comes from by looking at its continuity within the broader process of universal history, going back to our starting point was ancient Babylon and how Babylon and the, the network of cults under a priesthood that has a certain method of operation um, managed to transform itself to, to sort of find a new host in the form of Persia, um, which then transformed itself at a certain point too when that was defeated by the forces associated with Plato's Academy. Um, a little after Plato had died under the form of Alexander the Great, who had destroyed the Persian Empire and for about 12 years had created a new type of paradigm, a new, a new idea of a dynasty that wasn't based upon simply extraction of wealth from slave labor um, or di divide to conquer wars. It was based upon an idea of city building, the extension of the greatest aspects of Hellenistic civilization, philosophy, the arts, architecture across the world and a very different philosophy of international relations too, which I think has a lot to do with the growth of the new Silk Road that emerged onto the scene only about uh, 60 or so years after Alexander was assassinated by networks which were very closely associated with one of Plato's leading enemies, uh, Aristotle, and specifically Aristotle's nephew who was blamed at the time for having been the poisoner of Ale uh, Alexander. That being said, that was a wake-up call for Persia, and Persia then, or at least the, the network of associated families, oligarchical priesthoods that managed a certain, you know, common set of mystery schools. The cult of Apollo at Delphi was one well, of the branches of this thing. Right. Well, I'm just going to hit mute there. Oh, thank you. Um, but that wake-up call uh, forced this oligarchical parasite to realize that it was much weaker than it had formerly believed and needed to find a new set of a, a new host to latch onto. Of course, after Alexander died, his lower, the, there was much lower quality of thinking in his generals, the Ptolemies, um, the various generals, there was eight or nine of them um, who ended up becoming little warlords with their own little mini dynastic systems that went into a, a situation of decay. But despite that, um, one of the key most safe strategic zones that this oligarchy set their sights on um, was located in the West. And that this, of course, I'm referring to Rome. Now, the problem was Rome had an alliance that had been maintained since around 500 BC with Carthage. And for about 260 or 270 years, Roman Carthage had a strategic bond and alliance, um, which was relatively unbreakable. It was resolidified by four treaties. Um, they'd come to each other's defenses on a, on a variety of occasions, and it was a real beachhead. Um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily uh, the type of humanistic uh, Renaissance dynamic that Plato was envisioning when he put forth his Republic and created his Academy in order to create a philosopher King and resolve this problem that human society had been plagued with of forever falling into anarchy to tyranny and anarchy to tyranny cyclically. Um, it didn't quite meet up, but it was moving in that direction. There was a lot of good. And we could see that with the, the idea of the Roman Republic, which was very much not an empire and it's, it's high, you know, appraisal of virtue. Um, there's a certain recognition of, 
of morality, the superiority of being having a virtuous life that leads to happiness versus a life of uh, uh, devoted to, to wrong passions, vice, which makes the soul sicker. Carthage as well had, there's corruption in both of those, those states, but it also had a very strong uh, mercantile um, commercial heritage, a certain, you know, Ionian, uh, North African um, city, building, city building dynamic, which was very strong. So that had to be destroyed. And the way this was destroyed was in the form of three Punic Wars. And by the third Punic War, this is a point when Cicero and Augustine, who we, who we talked about in our last lecture, they zero in on the third Punic War being the moment when Rome really lost her soul. And her new fate was in some sense sealed in uh, 146 BC. And this was a point when Carthage had given up right after a three year siege. They had said, we, we give up, we cannot fight anymore. We lay down our arms, you win. And despite the surrender, it was ignored by uh, Rome. And instead, Rome followed the advice of the, uh, the Council of 15, which was sort of the, the council that controlled the sibling books that the sibling books, of course, being those things which uh, contained I think there was 14 or 15 sibling books that had all of the different mutterings of the Oracle at Delphi that were then interpreted by the priesthood that would then tell the kings, or in this case, uh, senators, who to go, go to war with, who to accept a peace treaty with, who to accept a surrender with, and who not to. Um, and in this case, the Oracle at Delphi, aka Zeus, aka Marduk, which were different names previously for the same thing of, of Apollo, said no. Carthage must be destroyed, Carthage de Linda Est. And everybody was massacred. The women and children were brought into slavery and all of Carthage's territory were absorbed into Rome, Rome becoming then really a Roman empire. It took another hundred or so years. It took Cicero's death, his assassination, to really consummate this, um, this empire. But that was really the moment. And let me just do a screen share here, just to, so I wanna do a little recap. Um, so yeah, this was the uh, the first picture. Um, <clears throat> here, let me just do a full screen. All right, so that was the picture that I selected. Today we're gonna be focusing on Thomas More, but I, I'm just doing this recap because I really want people to have a sense of this thing. So that was the picture of the, the expansion of the Persian empire at its maximum. Um, we have Alexander the Great's empire there. Alexander the Great is dead now. And this is the warring different factions, the Seleucids, the Antigonus, uh, Domain, Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy of North Egypt. Uh, Ptolemy ended up controlling or having a, a strong uh, relationship, an alliance with Rome after Carthage was, or during the time of the battles with Carthage that went for about 100 plus years. Carthage had another alliance with um, Syria as well, the Syrian general whose name I'm forgetting during that same period. And this is where I think it's also very important to keep in mind the role of the Middle East, especially Gaza, Palestine, which you could see there directly at the intersection between the Syrian uh, zone of Antigonus, who had the, the alliance with Carthage, and Ptolemy, who had the alliance with Rome. Right there is where you have a, a very important need to try to seduce or, or get control as much as possible of the people of Judea. Um, I think the translation of the Septu Septuagint, or Septuagint, uh, the first Greek translation from the uh, of the Hebrew um, Bible is very interesting that that took place under the uh, sponsorship of the Ptolemies around 175 or so BC, right before the, the Third Punic War. Um, so this is a very in, important geopolitical territory then as it is today and as it has always been. Um, so that's an important thing just to keep in the back of the mind. This is the picture of... Uh, of Carthage and of uh, Rome while they were still allies. And once Carthage was destroyed, its territories were taking control. So this is what we see now is the growth of Rome um, to the point of its maximum territorial possessions in 117 AD. And again, as we went through last week, uh, we remember that the cults of Rome involved the, the Gaia cult was a big one, the, uh, AKA Sybil. Um, Isis cult was also big that came in from North Africa, from Egypt, um, that was installed by, I forget who Julius, Julius Caesar had overthrown, um, Pompey. Pompey had brought in that, that cult. Um, <clears throat> you also had uh, the cult of Magna Meter, which was a 
big uh, part of the uh, the inner guard, the upper level uh, uh, warriors, the Praetorian Guard of Rome that had, that had been involved with the assassinations of countless Roman Empire emperors over the years, um, and many others. This is also the, the, the cult network that controlled the, the tax collecting. Um, it controlled the banking operations in many ways, the proto banking system. Um, since everybody who needed to do business, or they, everyone who needed to have a policy decision had to go to the cults, which, whichever one they worshiped to, and, uh, and be told what to do. So that cost a lot of money. And the cults accumulated a lot of cash doing this. I'm just gonna fix something on my computer here. Okay, um, that's another way of just seeing the Roman Empire at its full expanse. This is, the ambition was global hegemony, okay? This is, there was an absolute idea of a complete world dominance. Um, that was the sort of religious impetus behind this thing. You know, we went through the burning of the, uh, of Rome by Nero, the first inside job in modern, or in history, as far as I know. Uh, that was blamed entirely on the Christian, Christians and that justified a couple hundred years of Christian prosecution, the Roman, Roman candles, as you see there around a Colosseum, with Christians being uh, eaten alive. This went on as a form of entertainment for all the way up until about 315 or so. Um, this, was, this was regular practice. Um, the Jews at different times as well were both attacked. The Romans, of course, saw Christians just as simply one other uh, sect of Jews. It didn't really differentiate the two so much. Um, but they were played off against each other in many ways too. Um, and so this, this is what resulted over time in the shaming of the people watching. I mean, many of the, the, pe the, the people in the audience were just simply over time just shamed that they were taking pleasure. They were you know, being induced to watch these blood bats with people, Christians who were just taking pain, taking their fate um, in order to keep their souls alive with greater dignity than any of them could have, that, than you would have imagined possible. And, and just the, the power of this thing and the, the general message of loving, of, of having a, an idea of not just an infinite amount of gods with infinite amount of truths, which was the, the Roman pantheon system, but rather the idea of one loving God that made us in his image, uh, that we could participate in the process of creation. This was a very powerful idea within the context of a decadent, corrupt society that was longing spiritually for something of substance. And it began to really take hold, as we all know that story. So I won't go through that. By the end, uh, Augustine is now writing in a period where Rome is on, it, it, it's at the end of a, of a system. It's, it's in a system collapse. The, it had already schismed into an East and West division. The West was really basket case. It was going into a, a, its first... Uh, full-blown assault by the Visigoths and the Huns and the Vandals uh, that did their first take takedown in 410. Um, Augustine wrote his City of God, which was in many ways his Republic that we talked about as well last week, um, as both a historical document as well and a spiritual psychological diagnosis of what was at the heart of the collapse of Rome. Was it the, was it the, the turning one's back on the gods and the gods were just punishing the Romans or was it something else? Was was it really Christianity, which was the fault of, of Rome's misfortunes, which is what many people were trying to say at the time? And Augustine just destroys these arguments and just gets across even before Christianity existed. Even Cicero had argued that Rome had lost her moral fitness to survive, her mandate of heaven. So <clears throat> we ended our class last week with this image featuring the different assaults between 410 or 400 all the way up till 450 with the dissolution of the Roman Empire, of the West at least. Um, the Eastern Empire was also suffering heavy attacks by the new Persian Empire. Um, also the newly formed Arab states, of uh, uh, the Muslim states were also beginning an assault with the Umayyad Caliphate uh, against the uh, Eastern Byzantine Empire. So they, they really had their hands full, their territories were on the decline. And as you could see, just like after Alexander was killed, um, there was a complete um, meltdown into tiny feudal um, or fighting factioning uh, warlords, um, which had their own little mini dynasties. The zone today that we're going to be looking at will involve uh, an area in the armpit of Venice or in the armpit of Italy here. Can you get, can everyone see my, my cursor? So that, that area here, um, in the Ostrogoth controlled zone is, uh, is Venice. 
Venice will play a very big part of this story as we get into what was Thomas More, who lived in the 15th century, what was he dealing with? And also 16th century, early part. What was he actually part dealing with? What was this evil? Um, where did it come from? So that, that question can only be answered by knowing this backstory. Um, I'm gonna do one thing more here. I set up two images just to keep this in as another idea in, in mind. I want people to also, one of my intentions in this class series is to give people a sense of what are they looking at when they see the, um, when they hear terms like the rules-based international order, right? The, the, the democracy, the good countries, the, 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 the non-authoritarian countries who were invited to, to such things as the December 2021 Democracy Summit hosted by Biden. Um, in brown, in light brown are the, those who were invited and those in gray were not invited now that's half the nations of the world were not invited and i would say even of those who were invited um most of those don't even really qualify as the rules-based international order they were threatened to be there um india pakistan many countries of south america of the middle east i mean only two were invited um africa many of these countries have very deep economic and security ties with Russia, with China, especially, and this uh, new Silk Road. So even this is a bit of a fiction, what you're seeing. Um, the new Silk Road, as I think everyone knows, is a, a revival of an old idea. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, too. It's based upon a certain paradigm of win-win cooperation, of, of the idea that economics has to be based upon the creation of wealth, not just the extraction of wealth, or as Xi Jinping even points out, houses are meant to be lived in, not to be speculated upon. Doing the sorts of things that you do in Wall Street or the city of London in Eurasia, economically speaking, especially China, will get you in prison. You cannot just gamble for the most part. Um, it does happen in isolated zones, like in the, the housing bubble, there was a little bubble or a big bubble in China. But overall, the economy is driven by the creation of large-scale industrial growth. Um, 5, 15, 20, 30, 50-year projects are what defines the behavior of, of profits, of investment strategies, of, of everything else. So that's, that's not a way that we here in the West are taught to think about economics when we go to school. Um, but that's also why these countries and those who are doing business with the, the, the Eurasian partnership were not invited to such things as the good guys democracy summit um otherwise known as the commonwealth the british commonwealth countries were all a driving part the five eyes community the, the nato countries were all sort of these are the good people the ones who are well be behaved okay so what is the what is being revived here this is something which goes back like i said to the time of alexander the great um, who extended hellenistic civilization and opened up new corridors of ecumenical dialogue and trade with the East going all the way, extending his, his uh, dynasty all the way into today's Afghanistan and uh, Western India, um, where you have things like Bactria. Um, I mean, many, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite something. Many of this, much of this history has been suppressed, but it's, there's a lot of it there where there, you have, you know, temples to uh, uh, Mahayana Buddhism that are uh, designed with the golden section and with uh, Hellenistic aesthetics, very naturalistic systems, but that integrated a variety of positive influence of a variety of, of interesting East and West cultures. Um, so that was something which was 2000 plus years old, it was revived again. And I'm going to say something about when it was revived again, because it collapsed in 200 AD, the, the Silk Road with the collapse of the Han Dynasty. However, despite the fact that in Europe, you had chaos, you also had had chaos in Asia and China. I don't have a picture of that um, with the um, with the collapse of the Han Dynasty. So for about 400 years, there was relative disharmony on ongoing wars in China um, until the Silk Road was again revived in the early seventh century under the Tang Dynasty that revived Confucianism as a governing sort of uh, paradigm of China. And with that was the the Silk Road became uh, it's the, the basis of China's foreign policy with uh, not just the northern territories of today's Russia, uh, all the way up to Europe, but also through the Middle East, through the Abbasid dynasty. 
So what was it that unified that brought this into some state of coherence? Well, see this, this Frankish kingdom is a very important little kingdom, which was run by uh, Charlemagne, his grandfather, Charles Martel, his father, uh, Pepin the, the Short, <laughs> um, who and Charlemagne. The, these three, along with Charlemagne's son, Louis the Pious, did probably the most to unify uh, Europe in the, the most holistic way that we've we'd ever seen. It didn't last long, but it was a unified Europe. Um, what you see in yellow are the conquests of a part of uh, the Spanish, the Muslim controlled Spanish territory, which included an area called Septimania, which is uh, down here. That was what Pepin the Great uh, controlled. Narbonne is one of the key uh, trade zones, a, a port town, but, but a key economic engine of the world. And this was the end point of one of the Silk Road corridors. But it wasn't just this area, and, and keep in mind, this was Charlemagne's leadership uh, dominated from about 768 until 814 when he died. But it was known as a Renaissance period, and it really was a Renaissance. Um, this is another, let's zoom out a little bit and look at the broader chemistry. So if you look at the broader chemistry, um, Venice, again, which is the seat, just like Rome was selected to be the new seat or host of evil, Venice was early on selected, but the oligarchy's forces were still relatively scattered. You had elements of it still holding on to power in Rome. You had elements of it holding on to power in, uh, in Constantinople. And you had elements of it that had escaped the, the hordes of the Huns and, and what have you by going to Venice. But it was a very scattered uh, dynamic. It, it, the empire hadn't consolidated its power yet. And then you have a lot of other, other uh, different groups. The Khazar Cognate is another interesting group who I've been speaking about quite a bit lately. And I'm going to say something more about this today too. And the Abbasid Caliphate as well is, is, was relatively new. They had come to power, I think it was only in 750 around the same time that the Carolingian uh, kings of Pepin, Charlemagne's father, were, were consolidating their power with the Frankish Empire. Um, 750 was a big day. And that's also the big, or the big year that also the Khazar Cognate, which was formerly sort of a shamanistic uh, Turkish uh, kingdom, had done something very interesting by converting to Judaism. As their, uh, as their religion. Now, it wasn't a forced religion or conversion of everybody, but King Bulan, as the story goes, and his court did convert. And uh, you had then an interesting relationship between the Jewish kingdom of Khazaria, you had the, the Muslim um, dynasty of the Abbasids, and you had the Christian Frankish kingdom of the Carolingian Renaissance. The Abbasid period is also known as a, the Abbasid Renaissance as well. Um, under al-Mahdi, Harun al-Rashid, who co-ran his empire at the same time that, that Charlemagne ran his. And to take a step back, <laughs> the thing that we cannot forget that's governing the entire world stage at this time is that Silk Road revival that moves, as you can see there, with the Russian aspect through the steppe Silk Road in the north and many branches going through the Abbasid dynasty all the way to, to uh, Charlemagne's territory. And that's the Taizong emperor who did the most to uh, keep this thing alive. All right, so this is, this is just so important. Uh, just to hold this in mind, because you can't understand Venice if you don't understand this. And you can't understand more and what was being revived with the European golden renaissance out of Florence if you don't understand this process here. Because history is one unified thing. And that's really one of my goals here is to get people to see the different, the things that are often treated as different things as actually different sides of the same thing when it's approached from a principal top-down way. Um, what you have there is a 19th century painting by a French painter featuring uh, Harun al-Rashid and uh, Charlemagne's delegates who are conducting a uh, series of um, diplomatic envoys, embassies um, between one another. Obviously, things didn't. This is not a, a real painting. This is just a, a representation of a general spirit of policy that happened between this friendship, this strong bond and alliance between the Christian and Muslim kingdoms. At the time, there was a lot of effort by the new ultramontane papacy and Venetian diplomacy that had begun to, to develop a reputation for creating uh, divisions and wars um, to get a, a war between Muslims and Christians specifically Charlemagne. 
And, uh, and the idea was to take back control of the Holy Land. Um, this is something that luckily was avoided by the very creative diplomacy of Charlemagne, who and his and Harun al Rashid specifically. When Harun al Rashid, I think this actual painting indicates one of the stories whereby Harun al Rashid, in uh, I think it was 802 or 803, um, was the year, he provided a long, he basically provided an elephant and hundreds of expensive gifts, silk and other things as a gift to Charlemagne, but amongst the gifts, including the elephant, was a deed for the Holy Land. And uh, Harun al-Rashid basically said in this deed, rather than going to war, this deed entitles you to ownership of the Holy Land. It is yours. Don't worry about it. We don't want it. It's yours. But we will protect it. And that was just it was a brilliant maneuver. Um, overall, the um, under, under Charlemagne, what you had was a uh, city, like you had every parish was forced to have schools. You had a great process of learning. Literacy was increasing. There was a unified dialect, a, a, a common language, since that was being lost in the times of disc discord and division. Everyone was speaking their little mini local dialects and couldn't speak, understand each other. So that was increasingly one of the big projects. There were public works was defining the Carolingian uh, Renaissance period. The Rhine-Danube Canal got started. Um, they, there were strong policies that Charlemagne put down on uh, on lords, um, or not lords, but basically there were anybody who was going to con to have land under under their influence were uh, legally obliged to develop the land. If the land wasn't developed, it would mean that they forfeit their right to have possession of land. That was a very interesting flank. He also had strong price controls as well to ensure that there was no um, artificial price manipulation. Um, if you were, um, if you controlled a lot of wheat or other things, you were not allowed to withhold. You had to ensure that there was no starvation in any of the feudal estates. So it was a general orientation towards strong progress, but also you had um, an, an attempt to create a network of, of, of schools that would build philosopher kings. And this, this grew out of the monastery system as well that, would, that had been preserved under the Augustinian networks in... Uh, in Ireland, so after Augustine died, who we talked about again last week, his platonic um, approach to Christianity did not continue in Europe. It, it pretty much uh, got washed away. It didn't hold, but and it would have probably have been lost forever had it not been for St. Patrick in a network of Augustinian um, statesmen who ended up moving and organizing the pagan, um, you know, groupings of of ireland and completely had a transformative irish renaissance culture around monasteries that again taught children orphans to read that uh i mean the idea of writing became a way of communicating with god it wasn't something you just like bandied about and literacy the, the written word was really a sacred thing so that was what was brought back in and when it was brought back into europe around the 500 period um that's what became the um or the 590 period that's what became the base of what organized Pepin, um, Charlemagne, and others. But it wasn't just that. It was very much in harmony with the houses of wisdom. So under Harun al-Rashid, you had Christians, Muslims, Jewish scholars together, learning, doing astronomy, geometry, making discoveries in the houses of wisdom, which were sort of these platonic academies set up centered in Baghdad. Um, and then later on in, uh, in Syria, when uh, Harun al-Rashid moved the capital from Baghdad to uh, Syria. Um, in Charlemagne's territory, we brought up um, Septimania. That was an area where, again, Narbonne was a kingdom, which was a, a kingdom that was a Jewish kingdom with the House of David. And, and Charlemagne specifically requested that some descendant from the House of David be brought in from Baghdad, which was done, um, who ruled that kingdom. One of uh, Charlemagne's, I believe it was one of his daughters, he married to that uh, king as well. And it was... Uh, it was a primarily Muslim dominated uh, territory with Muslim uh, governors. So it was again, a very ecumenical Muslim Jewish Christian re relationship. The other thing to keep in mind is that the, the Jewish kingdom of Khazar, Khazaria, which played a key role as a node in the, in the steppe silk road from East West relations was also an area 
that had um, Muslim protection. They had 7,000 Muslim troops maintaining the majority of their, their soldiers with the idea that if any country were to attack Khazaria, they would be defended by the, the Muslim soldiers. However, if Khazaria, for whatever reason, should attack uh, an Islamic state, then the soldiers would go would defend the Islamic state against the Khazars. So it was a, an interesting check and balance. And the Jewish Radonite traders, so were, were renowned for being like Renaissance men. They could speak upwards of 12 different languages, at least, including Chinese. Uh, they maintained many of the key trade routes uh, east and west. And Charlemagne also made a point that these groups who negotiated the different uh, inter-civilizational treaties economically, commercially, uh, security-wise, were the primary diplomat diplomats as well. Um, that's that's also an interesting. It's the it's them that brokered actually the peace deal between Harun al Rashid and Charlemagne regarding the the story of the elephant. That was the Jewish red knight uh, uh, diplomats. So again, you have this whole thing that people like Samuel P. Huntington, Bernard Lewis, and others today would say is impossible because today's geopolitics is premised around the idea that civilizations of different cultures and religions can do not but war with each other. There's no way to have a community of principle in the mind of a Zbigniew Brzezinski, for example. It doesn't exist. However, that's why these sorts of examples where uh, humanity being humanity, being natural, creative, and um, you know, ourselves devoid of influence or manipulation by an oligarchy, uh, we actually demonstrate that indeed we are capable of respecting each other's differences while cherishing what we have in common and being universal, which is why this whole, um, I think, story has been so skewed and crushed and erased from our history books, even this because our kingdom itself was destroyed after a couple hundred years. And to this very day, it's very difficult to find any remnants of this, this kingdom. It was really um, well, we'll see a little bit more about that. But the, the growth of the, the Venetian um, oligarchy plays a big role. And Charlemagne even tried, his, he even deployed his son Pepin, who was also named after the grandfather, to destroy Venice. And, he, and there was a six-month siege that Pepin, his son, laid on Venice at a certain point. It, it hadn't been located in the city of Venice yet. It was still Ravana, uh, Ravina. But it was a lagoon city. It was very difficult to conquer. And after six months, unfortunately... Um, and a lot of inner sabotage. Pepin dies, supposedly of malaria. The, the whole campaign dissolves. And uh, that's the last sort of attempt to, to take Venice for quite some time. Um, one other thing that's interesting that I noticed just uh, this week is that one of the early doges tried to make an alliance. He, did, he committed a, a coup d'etat in Venice and tried to create an alliance with Charlemagne at around 803. Um, but that was very short lived and he was soon assassinated. And we're going to say, say a little bit more about what was what was Venice. But first, after Charlemagne dies, it's important to see how beautiful this this period was between 780 and 850 of this Renaissance period of different faiths, you know, Confucian, Buddhist, Jewish, Christian, Muslim around a, a common community of principle. But <clears throat> unfortunately, like everything that tends to go awry when it's uh, left under, under the controls or influence of an oligarchy, Charlemagne's wisdom did not fall through to his grandchildren. And of the three grandchildren, um, I think they were called uh, Louis Lothar and Charles the Bald, um, they were induced stupidly to go to war with each other. And not only go to war with each other, but under certain... Um, agents who are associated with Venice, a, a deal was brokered called the, uh, the Oath of Strasbourg, where the two brothers on, on east and west sides of the kingdom in, in light green and, and purple signed a treaty that basically had them declare their alliance to each other against their brother Lothar, who uh, had this territory carved out for him in the middle called Lotharingia. And, uh, and that just dissolved into ever more divided microstates and and the borders of today's Europe the European cultures including the European cultural um weak points that have been exploited by the oligarchy over the last 1000 to 1300 years have have their roots in these um revanchist um transgressions that had happened between these different groups 
that's that's uh, something which a lot of Europeans today are afraid to look at, but, but it's it's true. And I would say that the person who put a, the most of this work together for me was Pierre Baudry, whose uh, work will be in a in the description box of this, this video. He did a, a remarkable remarkable book um, on the story. So now we're getting closer to the, the point I really want to talk about today, um, which is what the hell is this new Roman Empire thing that later on took over control of England? What is Venice? And what you see there is a picture of Venice at, I think, the peak of, it, peak of its influence. Um, it says here, I think this is 614, a little bit after Thomas More, a century after Thomas More. <laughs> began to get really politically active. Um, this is also after the Genoa, um, which is another city-state, and Venice had an alliance. So this is the sphere of influence of Venice. Venice was a maritime empire. It was, even though it was an independent city-state, it was known as a, the, the, the Serene Republic, the Republic Serenissima. But it wasn't really a republic. It was a very peculiar type of, of uh, system. It was, a, as, as James Fenimore Cooper documented, and Cynthia Chung did a really wonderful class on Cooper's exposure of Venice, it was really an oligarchy, um, a very well-controlled oligarchy very self-governing system. Genoa was another city-state, very similar in some ways to, to Venice as another maritime center of pus, parasite, and cult control, but it wasn't as well self-controlling. It wasn't as well-governed. Venice, in the, in the 800 or so years of its existence, really didn't have any um, internal turmoil. There was no foreign invasion that was successful up until Napoleon finally uh, did them away. And that was, it, it seems, a controlled demolition in some ways. Um, cause they had already found by the time of Napoleon, they had found the oligarchy had found a new base of operations through which to work. So it wasn't as strategically vital to keep that under the same type of control, but it, it really only went through, I think one, I mentioned the one doge at the very early days in 802 or so who, uh, who tried to align with Charlemagne and got killed. Um, later on in around the, the mid 14th century, there was another doge that tried to, um, get control of uh and or to have an independent policy don't really know the full story but he uh, that didn't last long the little conspiracy he tried to lead lasted about a day and then he was dragged out uh into the saint mark square and had his head cut off um in public so what is the doge the doge is sort of like um it's kind of well the, the the word itself comes from duke um uh I mean the 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 yeah like the yeah the idea is it came from Duke but it it was the the head of the 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 fount of all honors of Venice so the way Venice is structured as a government is you have a Senate which had at its max about fifteen hundred uh, members the only people who could become senators were people from the specific accepted leading noble families of Venice um, you couldn't just be a a regular citizen in fact there was no way for regular citizens to have any influence whatsoever on policy in venice there was there was nothing whatsoever it was a it was a lot of poverty a lot of decadence the idea of venetian uh, masquerades and things like that um that's where that comes from so it's a society of decadence again a lot of poverty a lot of disease um but the inner controls were the senate and then above the senate you had a, a, something called the committee of ten Above the Committee of Ten, you had the Committee of Three, which had absolute control over over pretty much the interpretation of law of everything else, and they also had control of who lives or who dies. Because the way Venice worked was it was sort of a um, a police state. They had like one out of every twenty or so people they say was an operative for the secret police of Venice, and there were rewards for ratting on your neighbor if anybody was saying something that had a politically um, uh, that had political views that were unacceptable to the elites, you would be rewarded for ratting out your neighbor. Um, pe people were, you know, whispering in uh, public markets or even in private about what their views were about anything that, that had any political importance. And anytime you could, you want to accuse somebody, all you needed to do was write their names and put it in 
the mouth of a, of a lion. There was, there was one of these lions in St. Mark's Square. And uh, very promptly, that person would be executed and their, their body would find it's, would, would be found floating in the lagoons of Venice. Venice was mostly, if people seen the pictures, there's no roads really to speak of. It's uh, a society where you have to use little funny looking boats to get everywhere. Um, the people who decided the, um, the secret trials um, was the committee of three. The committee of three had absolute power and would keep even the doge in check. The doge was sort of the, the symbol at the head of the, the pyramid and uh, was appointed there for life, usually by the previous doge. But again, the doges could be eliminated too. And so it was a very, again, self-controlling system. And there was a lot of turnover. So they wanted to make sure that everybody, nobody would ingrain themselves in one singular position for too long. Um, so above the actual governance structures, you know, kind of like the British Privy Council works in some ways similar to this. You had still the same um, priesthoods, Masonic type orders, um, managing things as part of the shadow government of the shadow government. So you had shadows of shadows. It was a very Byzantine uh, system. Now, how did they get this amount of power? Because if you go back previous to, previous to this image, at, at 800, 850, 900, Venice was still just a very tiny little zone. It was, it was really just here, and it was a, a small sort of sister state allied to the Byzantine Empire in Constantinople. It wasn't the dominant source of evil in 800, 900, 950. So what exactly um, happened? How did that occur? And so to answer that, um, Venice began to organize finally the thing that they had tried to do, this, this um, crusade of Christian versus Muslim worlds to take back the Holy Land. It had failed under Charlemagne and Harun al-Rashid, but it, it worked. It took them a while, but the first crusade funded by the Venetians who had developed an incredible array of banking and, uh, and bullion control, silver control. This was something that they were really getting proficient at. And again, they had the biggest fleet and the biggest manufacturing of ships uh, called the, the uh, arsenal. They, they, and, through, and it was not just through... So one thing that they did in 1122 is they organized finally effectively the first crusade with the help of one of their agents in the, in the papacy. Um, in order to get a, a Christian war with mercenaries to take back the Holy Land. This set up a trend all of a sudden of wars. Uh, hopes for peace treaties of East and West began to really fall apart. Oh, sorry, this is 1096, sorry. Uh, the second crusade was 1147. The third crusade um, continues on in 1189. And the fourth crusade is a big one. So the fourth crusade in 1202 was again orchestrated by the Venetians. The um, the various uh, Lombard and Frankish um, uh, warlords who wanted a piece of action because they were promised a lot of you know you're going to get every time you you take over a Muslim city the, the, these areas were very rich you know the Baghdad the, there was an Andalusian Renaissance in Spain the Baghdad. Uh, zone in Syria were still very rich. They had still experienced a certain Renaissance culture. Um, so if you could loot them, that's a lot of money. And so it, it you know, was, was easy pickings for a lot of uh, mercenaries to, to make a fortune doing these sorts of things. Um, Richard the Lionheart, for example, who's celebrated in, in British um, circles today around the round table movement, was himself just another warlord mercenary. The Knights Templars, uh, were also a big part of this as well. So <clears throat> this fourth crusade didn't really work as planned. The previous three crusades did involve wars against the Turks, against the other uh, uh, Muslim states. The fourth crusade, however, was weird. The um, Instead of actually making it to, um, to the promised land, which of course required Venetian boats to, tr to carry, I think it was something like 20,000 soldiers and their pages and, and everything else. There was a lot of boats. That cost a lot of money. Oh yeah, 33,000 crusaders were supposed to be a part of that. And uh, unfortunately, well, the Venetians had an idea. They said, well, if you, you don't have the money to pay us, that's okay. What you can do is help us put down um, a rebellion in a, in a Venetian protectorate that was trying to uh, have a 
have a uh, an independence movement with the Hungarians who were who were helping them, and it was that was the city of Zara. So that, just put them down. You could loot them, even though it's a it's a Christian community. Ignore that fact. You could loot them and use the money to pay us. So they did that, <laughs> and the Crusaders first their first task was to destroy Zara, submit it back into the control of Venice, looted them. But the money was still inadequate to pay for the ships, so they deployed in that in that case with plan number two to get money to pay Venice. What was this plan? Well, the Venetians under uh, I think it was Do Dandolo, a leading Venetian family from the Roman Empire, um, or who could trace his lineage back to the Roman Empire. His idea was okay. Well, look, Constantinople, they've sinned against God, um, so they. It's okay if we actually, even though they're Christian, it's okay if we uh, destroy Constantinople, the Byzantine Empire, and loot them. That's okay, because they've sinned against God. And uh, and so these mercenaries were, they didn't ask too many questions, and they just went ahead and, and went on the, the Venetian boats. And uh, together with the Venetian soldiers and paid mercenaries, they destroyed Constantinople over the course of the two-year period and looted Constantinople, which is why today in, in Venice, you see all of these, these Byzantine, you know, um, statues everywhere it's it's quite something if you just google venice architecture it's it's look it's super it looks super byzantine and that's why it's because they stole a lot of the ornaments and artifacts and everything that was then transported to uh saint mark square um they stole it all from from constantinople and killed a hell of a lot of christians along the way and that that was it that so with that loot they didn't really have they were carrying so much booty at that time that they didn't really have the means or desire to go to the holy land at that point they just wanted to enjoy their wealth they paid um they paid uh venice everything that was owed for the boats of course and venice got their own cut of uh of raping constantinople including basically taking control of all of constantinople's shipping and trade corridors um east-west relations this was all then taken over by byzantium in the very same way that the roman M the rome took over Carthage's territory, it was sort of very similar in so many ways to what Venice then did uh, that brought us then to something approximating this type of situation here. So um, there's a lot here, and I'm, I'm oversimplifying quite a bit. Um, but just to keep in mind as well, Venice not only was in was interested in controlling banking, by this time they had controlled, again, like I said, the bullion, the gold, the silver bullion, um they had also controlled trade routes through the east all the way up to mongolia and this was the only um the venetians were the only europeans allowed free reign in mongol controlled territories under genghis khan and his heirs people like the venetian marco polo was a personal advisor as was his father to kublai khan it has been written by many authors how the venetians were able to provide their profound intelligence because by having control of the shipping and also having a, a, a broad, very well organized diplomatic core of, of spies embedded in all of the courts across Europe, France, you know, everywhere in uh, in Turkey, Egypt, there were there were Venetian uh, embassies and they were known to have the best espionage, the best profiling of courts, the best profiling of individuals and the, the, the best techniques of playing the weaknesses of individuals against each other to create conflict. So this intelligence was very useful to the Genghis Khan and his heirs when they wanted to take control of different territories going all the way up to Kiev Rus, um, Hungary, Bulgaria, um, all the way through the, the, the Arab states. Every place that fell, you'll usually tend to find a, a Venetian hand providing early intel um, of the weaknesses of the various courts that these savage uh, Mongolian hordes were were just taking down one after the other with their own idea of having a global uh, Khanate. So not only did you have that as an asset, they also had uh, strong alliances with the Ottomans. The, the Ottomans had a, a specific embassy in, uh, in Venice as well. And it was known the Venice, the Venetians were known to say that we are Venetians first and Christians second. That was sort of their their banner, which is why I think there was something like five different excommunications from from the early Crusades. Actually, this was one of the points of an excommunication. The the, the Pope at that time was so angry that a Christian crusade was going to kill a bunch of Christians that he excommunicated 
um, or threatened to excommunicate all the cru crusaders and Venice. And that didn't dissuade them. The money was too, it was too lucrative. Um, we're going to go through some other ones, but there were several other times that the whole city was excommunicated um, by various uh, popes who recognized this evil. So what was Thomas More? So Thomas More was somebody who was stepping into history. He lived between 1478 and 1535. He was dealing with an, an England that had so much potential. But it also was the target, just like Rome, the Roman Republic had so much potential to be great under its alliance with Carthage. Um, despite that greatness, it was the target of the parasite that wanted a new host. Why did that parasite want a new host? Why did Venice, why was not it not content remaining in the lagoons where we had found it? It seemed like it had a, a strong international network. It also... I, I, did, I forgot to mention, but controlling the seas, you also primarily control all of the mailing systems so you can read letters, right? That's a big part of, of espionage. Um, so why did it want to move from that location to Britain, Amsterdam and Britain? Um, and this is where Thomas More's role, what he's dealing with, uh, becomes quite important specifically the entire network that he is a part of, because these conspiracies for good or for bad never happen with just one person. There's a network usually of like-minded people who have wisdom or its opposite, who will work together to achieve goals. The question is, are these goals in harmony with natural law, God's law, or are they out of harmony with that law that's discoverable to creative reason of humankind, right? The, regardless of what religion uh, you are from, we all are endowed with these qualities of conscience, of reason, of creativity, and of a sense of moral purpose to our lives that we could shape, right? So if, if that natural law that, is, as uh, St. Paul says, is written on the hearts of all men, if that is active, then we know that the orientation that we're going to be moving in is going to be anti-oligarchical. Things will get better for people, uh, right, in time. It will not be getting worse it won't be decaying it towards a, sta a state of stasis and death it'll it'll be growing in, in terms of a state of improvement self-perfectibility and life the life principle so thomas more is certainly of that that view he is an augustinian um he is somebody who is a platonist he wrote in platonic dialogues just like augustine did he taught augustine actually um in a series of lectures, but we're going to say more about that in a second. The first question to hold in mind is why was Venice not happy being having the center of their control in the lagoons? Okay, so to answer that a little bit, um, we have to take a little step back here and recognize that the, the golden renaissance of Florence was something that did a lot of what Charlemagne was moving the world into, but was sabotaged. What earlier uh, Augustine had been trying to move the world into what was sabotaged or what earlier Alexander and the Platonic Academy had been trying to move the world into or the along with the Silk Road of, of the Han Dynasty, but was sabotaged. So there's a, a sort of impulse that's being sabotaged, right, for humanity to um, move to become mature to move into a, an age of reason. Um, that process, even though it culminated we see the effects of it most most beautifully at the end of the 15th century it was really earlier that we saw that the the seed of it was planted and it began really moving and when it began really moving was a period uh that had a leading figure around the name of nicholas of Cusa. i was first brought to attention of this person's name by the uh, the old master himself Lyndon, Lyndon larouche who had written a lot about nicholas of Cusa over the years and this broader history. And I, I wanted to make sense of this and understand it myself. So I started re reading some of the works that, that were cited by LaRouche, um, including Cusa's uh, Deducta Ignorantia, which is where this particular quote comes from, written in, or this quote was from 1434, around the time when you had an ecumenical council of Florence that was trying to heal the divisions within the church that had been created from the 1054 schism of East-West, around rather, I mean, issues that were somewhat i you know academic over the nature of the filioque wave that didn't that were not as serious as some people made it out to be i mean the filioque wave is a very important concept that augustine and even plato and cusa believed in very strongly 
and it's something that I think is provable. I, but at the same time, it wasn't the basis upon which to have an East-West divide and war, uh, which is unfortunately what did happen. So this was trying to heal a lot of these these ideological and and, and geopolitical wounds that had been created. And one of the, the things that Nicholas uh, writes, who's a leader of this um, momentum to reunify the church and to create a common spirit of development around natural law, is this idea that there is in the people a divine seed by virtue of their common equal birth and the equal natural rights of all men. So that all authority, which comes from God, as does man himself, is recognized as divine when it arises from the common consent of all the subjects. That is, that divinely ordained marital status of spiritual union based on a lasting harmony by which a commonwealth is guided in the fullness of peace towards eternal bliss. Now, he put out a lot of his works to really get across that you needed to have a philosopher king, but not just that, you have to have a culture that could that treated everybody like a potential philosopher king. That, right, that we all have equal birth, whether we're a king or whether we're a peasant, we're all born and made in the image of God. And the authority for laws, for governance, comes from the consent of the governed. That's a revolutionary idea of 300 years before, 350 years before the American Revolution. So, but this gets put into motion by leading figures, including one of his key allies, Piccamendolo. Um, Aeneas Piccamendolo is a, uh, or Picol Piccolomini, sorry, is uh, one of the key bishops or cardinals who is a very close student of uh, Cusa, who becomes the Pope uh, Pius. So despite the fact that there's often much corruption within the Vatican and Rome, there's, there's always a fight just like you have in the United States, right? Between a deep state and actual patriots, you have the same thing within Rome, going back to its early days. And Pope Pius, the, the, the follower of Cusa, the Platonist, he who plays a key role in the Council of, of Florence, um, says something very interesting about Venice. Hold on, let me just make sure I'm fixing something here. So he says, describing the Venetians, as among brute beasts, aquatic creatures have the least intelligence. So among the human beings, the Venetians are the least just and the least capable of humanity. They are hypocrites. They wish to appear as Christians before the world, but in reality, they never think of God and except for the state, which they regard as a deity. They hold nothing sacred, nothing holy. All law and right may be violated for the sake of power. So he's a figure who goes on to create an alliance um, of the different Christian uh, nations of Europe to finally destroy Venice. It takes a while because everybody's busy fighting each other. The, the British are fighting the French for the Hundred Years' War. Then meanwhile, as he's writing this, the British have their own, or the British will soon start their own civil war that goes on for 30 years, the War of the Roses. Um, you have... Um, which is the Plantagenets, Jeanettes, the Yorks, the Lancasters, all fighting um, as territorial you know, lords, being funded always by the Venetians, who are more than happy to fund all sides of every single war with their, their different outlets in the Lombard banking houses as well and, and in Germany. So they have different, different fifth columns in different countries, but you'll always find the same uh, center of command always in the Venetian lagoons. So they're... Pico, uh, sorry, um, Pope Pius II, uh, Cusa are very hard at work for a long time trying to organize a coalition. One of the leading figures of the coalition becomes this man's father, King Louis the uh, 11, or 12th. Actually, he, he is a leader. His father is one of the first um, leaders of Europe, one of the first kings to put fully into practice um, Cusa's view of natural law. And Louis XI creates the first sort of modern nation state system founded around a, uh, a complete cleansing, a purge of the, the traitors and the, the deep state corruption within France. He redefines the idea of value from being one of war making. He settles uh, peace agreements with, with uh, France's neighbors. That's a high point is, high, is diplomacy. He uh, instead of having money based upon speculation or going to war for extraction or, or extracting uh, feudal labor, 
it becomes based upon development. So internal projects, internal works, kind of like what Charlemagne was doing, the education of young, of orphans, the investment into the arts, um, literature, all these things become really the driving focus of what economics is. And this is then replicated um, in Europe with uh, Henry VII. And Henry VII is a king who is playing a big role in a league which is set up to destroy Venice. Um, he also is the king who uh, comes out and, and ends the, the War of the Roses and, and overturns uh, King Richard III, who Shakespeare describes very clearly in his play, King Richard III, as one of the most evil bastards um, as far as kings of, of Europe are concerned, pure tyrant. Uh, he overthrows him and institutes the Tudor uh, system and again replicates King Louis XI's uh, success, which is being followed by his son, Louis XII, who works with Henry VII as part of this anti-Venetian league. Um, Louis XII has a quote where he's talking about the Venetians, as he understands it, who are traitors in human blood, traitors to the Christian faith, who have tacitly divided up the world with the Turks, and who are already planning to throw bridgeheads across the Danube, the Rhine, the Seine, the Tagu, and the Ebro, attempting to reduce Europe to a province and to keep it subjugated to their armies. One of the, another key figure, a leader of the anti-Venetian movement at this time, uh, Ludovico Sforza, who's the Duke of Milan, he's very close with Leonardo da Vinci and in fact works with da Vinci and Machiavelli um, in the Milan-Florence alliance uh, around the 502 to 509 period. Uh, to to basically destroy Venice. Um, again, I'll say more about that. And he describes Venice. He says, the Venetians are obstinate and hardened, always keeping their mouths open to be, to be able to bite off, the bite off power and usurp the state of all their neighbors to fulfill the appetite of their souls, to conquer Italy and then beyond as did the Romans, thinking to compare themselves to the Romans when their power was at its apex. So it clearly identifies this global hegemonic ambition of Venice um, to have complete dominance of the world, um, far beyond even Rome. But he, they, everybody recognizes now for the first time that the people who had been funding, the bankers who had been funding all sides, providing the intelligence for one side to go to war with the other side, right? France to go to war with England, to go to war with uh, Maximilian's Holy Roman Empire, to go to war with uh, the Spanish Habsburgs, to go to war with the Papacy, the Papal States, all of these ongoing wars that had just littered the world and they were all being funded by the same people and, and everyone for the first time just had the the wisdom to talk with each other you had certain individuals like uh, machiavelli who played a very important role um organizing this process um there's a picture of henry the the seventh at the bottom right upper left is louis the 11th um what you have there is Erasmus, who was working in 1508 in uh, in Venice, nominally to get a translation project of Plato's works uh, accomplished, because Venice also had a near monopoly of printing presses. Um, whenever <laughs> they hate creating new technology, the oligarchy, but as soon as a new technology is created, they're the first ones to try to monopolize and gobble it up, and then make sure that anything being produced in the printing presses is as garbagey as possible. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a dual sided weapon, right? Um, information, and you could do a lot of good with it and you could do a lot of harm with it, depending on what content and substance you're putting out. So um, that's what Erasmus had spent 10 months organizing in Venice, probably doing a lot of espionage as well. We don't know because we don't have any of his writings for, throughout this entire three year period. It, it was all destroyed. So a lot of this stuff you have to sort of like induce and infer based on relationships, based on actions, based on function. Um, I included, for good measure, uh, a painting of Dante Alighieri at the bottom left-hand side with the uh, Dome of Florence at his upper left-hand corner and the opening of his uh, his canto, his uh, commedia, um, that had been written in the uh, 1300 period or 1280. And Dante being himself one of the key figures who kind of played a role. He was an Augustinian, a Platonist again. Um, you'll see this theme coming back again and again, who very much understood the role of the Venetians and who put into motion a process of city building. Um, the, the, the Dome of Florence, which is as Cynthia did in her wonderful class on the uh, Santa Maria del Fiore Dome, which is on our website, 
Um, this to this very day is the largest Mason dome in the world. Nothing has been able to beat this and we still can't figure out how it was done. Um, but it was done because of a project, th the project was div uh, Dante's brainchild. And he put this thing into motion to give people a multi-generational mission that would help them develop the best part of themselves. And it was through this process that took over 200 years to finalize, which Leonardo da Vinci ended up, um, that was what taught his education was working on this project under Brunelleschi, Brunelleschi, sorry. And it was da Vinci who put the final uh, golden dome at, at the top of the, um, this, uh, this Duomo. And, um, and this is the, the, you know, as Cynthia called it in her, in her uh, essay, it was the Apollo project of that period that, that organized the best and the brightest that created guilds, school systems, and an aesthetical sense of society, which is where Florence became the heart of the Renaissance. And out of that new engineering projects that had never been done before, uh, came online in the thousands of designs. Um, new approaches to medicine, right? This new opening up of the mind was able to discover new ways of, of thinking about medicine. Um, there was translations of Arabic uh, scholars like Ibn Sina, Avicenna in, into Europe as well that were being studied um, at this period as well. So an openness to other cultures and the greatest ideas of various cultures that were being synthesized. Ideas from Asia were coming on board. I mean, I, I've seen, we own a book by, by Menzies going through the... Um, the attempt by the Chinese to have a new Silk Road, a maritime Silk Road in 1420, which had evidence that there were even ships that not only went through to Africa, but all the way up to Europe. Um, that's been largely wiped out of our, our history books, but there, there's evidence of this. Um, this is where, again, the idea of, of human beings having no limits to our existence. We're, you know, you can't maintain the argument that we're just a, a talking cow to be controlled by a master class if we're making all of these beautiful discoveries, including in the arts, in music, and everything else, right? The idea that there are limits to population growth or that the old, that there's a, a divine right of kings mandated with the idea that a hereditary order has the power to control the, the slaves, that is easily proven wrong if you can get people who are not born of elite families to be greater creative geniuses than the encrusted elite is, which is what was happening on mass. So again, it's 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 not something that's purely academic. You can't just sit down and prove in a logical academic way um, why we shouldn't have you know population control uh, policies. You have to do it as well. You have to demonstrate that we can always overcome our boundary conditions, and uh, and that's the real essence of real physical economy as it was understood by, by Thomas More, by Dante, by the greatest um, founding fathers of the United States, like Ben Franklin, Hamilton, and you know, LaRouche as well, who had written and took this to another level. And this idea of cameralism, that was the word for the, the science of economy at this time, that, that was what Charlemagne was doing. Um, and it was known as cameralism. It originated in Italy. It was immediately replicated in France, in England, in Germany, and beyond. And everywhere it was applied, it worked with this basic principle of internal improvements. So money from is not going to war chests because you're working on peace tre treaties. So instead of paying for mercenaries, instead you're investing in infrastructure. You're building bridges. You're you're building canals. You're building hospitals. Um, so you're also investing in new technologies. So you're investing in creating new capital, right? Um, a lot of focus on education, especially the education of the young and the poor. Um, so the arts, culture, that's always being invested in science, new scientific discoveries that are not separated from the arts. There's no division. Uh, again, foreign policy of trade and diplomacy first. That's always the key. And the idea philosophically of natural law. All right, so now this is brings us to the last part of my, my presentation, um, where I want to just take about eight different uh, quotes that I just took from, from Thomas More's um, um, Thomas More's Utopia. So this is, I mentioned Thomas More was uh, born in the, in the 1470s. He was, uh, his father was a very close ally with Cardinal John Morton. John Morton was the Archduke, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury under Henry VII. I mentioned that that's the humanist philosopher King Henry VII, who had uh, organized the League of Cambrai. Oh, wait, actually, 
I didn't say anything about the League of Cambrai. All my talking, I, I avoided League of Cambrai. All right. So let's let's take a step back. <laughs> so Morton, uh, Henry the Seventh, uh, um, um, Thomas More's father were all part with Erasmus, with uh, many other figures, Machiavelli, Da Vinci. Um, Pope Julius II was a big one in organizing the League of Cambrai in, um, wait, where is that? That was uh, 15, December 1508. And the League of Cambrai involved not just Julius II, who was at that time the Pope, but a very corrupt Pope, but who was induced to come online. And when he was brought online, largely because of the networks of Cusa's followers, especially Pius II, who were still very active in the Vatican, he brought online Maximilian I, who, who was the Holy Roman Emperor. Emperor. He brought uh, Ferdinand II of Aragon. He brought, uh, so Spain, um, France. England was not yet on board, but a lot of English were getting ready, were trying to mobilize England to jump on board. And I would say that they probably would have had Henry VII not died that same year, 1508. Um, and the transition to Henry VIII was, was messy. So it kept England out of the, the, the fight. The, in Italy itself, um, Florence and Milan were the two strongest city-states who were part of this League of Cambrai. And they immediately all went to war on Venice. And Venice found themselves all of a sudden at the receiving end of everybody's rage, rightfully so. And at the Battle of Agnadello, which I think the anniversary of it is, is this month in April 20, uh, 1509, that was the biggest battle where all of the mercenary forces, Venice didn't have their own army, but so they always used mercenaries who don't really fight with the same creative passion as somebody who has something as a cause to fight for. They were all wiped out. The entire Venetian fleet was destroyed by the League of Cambrai. I mentioned that the um, uh, Machiavelli's soldiers took control not only of, uh, so Machiavelli had what was called a citizen's army. And that was an army of 10,000 uh, people who were trained as citizens to become soldiers. And they were, were focusing on geometry, astronomy, um, like basically the Pythagorean um, quadrivium or the, the, the platonic quadrivium was, was part of the, the process of just training people to have creative uh, brilliance so that each soldier was able to think holistically. Um, and with intellectual rigor while also having technical skills of a soldier. Um, this was a very effective army and they just took down every single uh, Italian um, vestige of, of, um, of Venice from Padua. Padua's university was the key intellectual control center of Venice that had been destroying Plato and promoting Aristotle, Aristotelian thinking. Um, we could talk about that in the Q and A. They took down uh, Rimini, Ravenna, Vincenzo, Otranto, Verona, all were taken down in a very swift period of time. And Da Vinci was coming up with all sorts of military equipment that was doing a really great job at destroying each one of these um, beach hole, uh, beachheads. Um, Sforza, like I said, was working in Milan, doing the same thing, working closely to them. And Da Vinci was actually made the head of engineer under Machiavelli when Machiavelli was made the head of, of Florence in 1502. So what happened? Why didn't Venice get destroyed? Why didn't the oligarchy finally get crushed? Well, this is something which we can only infer by some of the actions, but it had a lot to do with a bribe. So right at the last minute, when they were begging the, uh, the League to, or specifically the Pope, to not go ahead with their destruction, um, a certain bribe was laid by Venetian diplomacy um, in the Vatican, which ensured that Venice would return all papal states that had been taken under Venetian control uh, 200 years earlier. They would just give all the papal states back. And not only that, but all of the, uh, the alum, which was one of the most highly valued commodities for producing glass that was controlled in all of the papal states that were heavy in alum, would be purchased for two, three, four times above market value by the Venetians on top of providing a giant loan uh, to the bankrupt papal state. And uh, with this with this offer, it was something something Julius II couldn't refuse, and uh, he immediately declared the uh, the uh, the league kind of null and void in some ways. He basically said, "Okay, uh, we're going to have a new alliance, a new a new a new league set up." It was still called the League League of Cambrai for a bit, but this new one all of a sudden had the Venetians allied with the Pope, 
the, the, the Holy Roman Empire of today's mostly Germany was brought on board as well, because whatever the Pope does, the Holy Roman Emperor at that time would do. Um, and everybody all of a sudden went to war with France and Florence and Milan. And so all of a sudden, France, France and, and Florence found themselves fighting their, their former allies very quickly. Um, Mil Florence was the first to fall. F uh, France uh, ended up getting kicked out of Europe. The new, uh, the new uh, anthem uh, by the Pope was kick out the barbarians from Italy. And the barbarians here were not the Venetians. It was the French. The French, <laughs> and this is starting in 1509. So all of a sudden, the French are getting... Uh, getting their asses kicked by everybody. They're getting pushed out of uh, out of Italy, and um, Da Vinci avoids assassination. How to how by by escaping to France, where he's given safe haven. And this is where he ends up dying years later, under under the protection of of Louis the Twelfth and his son. Um, Machiavelli gets tortured and exiled, and his entire army, his citizen army, is is killed, massacred. Not one person is allowed to live. So Venice comes out somehow um, on top. And this is the, the ass kicking that Venice needed. This is kind of like the, uh, the, the Persian Empire, you know, it, realizing, oh, Persia is not as, as a safe host for us anymore. The, the priesthood needed to find a new, a new host, which is where they went to Venice, uh, Rome. Same thing here as well. And when Rome wasn't safe anymore, they had to find Venice. When Venice wasn't safe anymore, they had to find uh, Britain. And another humanist Renaissance zone of creative ferment was also the uh, the Amsterdam, the Dutch area, Fl the Flemish area. That was also very close. That's why Erasmus was a he was from this uh, zone as well. And um, so this became now the new focus. So this is the area. This is the time now that Thomas More is alive and operating. We don't have a lot of firsthand direct writings by of, of More describing this. We know that More. Um, let's say something about his, his personal life here. So more was <clears throat> his father was a friend of Cardinal Morton. So Morton was sort of the, not just the consigliere, he was, as more calls him in his utopia, Morton is a, is a character within the, the platonic dialogue section of the utopia. And, uh, and he'd been dead already for a few years when, when more wrote this, but he calls him the philosopher prince. And Morton was sort of the uh, the power, not the power, the 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 strongest advisor to uh, to Henry the Seventh, and he managed so much. He was kind of like the prime minister, but more even. And so, while he was an old man, Thomas More's father ensured that a young Thomas More, between the age of twelve and fourteen, was going to be the page in the household of Morton, who tutored him, um, really befriended the young the young kid. And just saw so much potential and said, you know, if when he grows up, he's going to be a, a, an exceptional man of history. And he was right. And he uh, he sponsored uh, Moore's education. Moore at, at the time was studying in Oxford, which was not yet a corrupt, uh, completely corrupt um, cesspool at that time. And uh, he studied in a, in a monastery, in an Augustinian monastery. At the time, he was still unsure of whether or not he wanted to go into public life. And it was in this monastery that he ended up meeting Erasmus in around 1497, 1498, and they became lifelong friends. Um, Erasmus was the leader of the Platonic Augustinian humanists of this time, a little bit older than Moore, but lived after him, uh, lived on after Moore died. Um, they, they worked together on many initiatives. And like I said, Erasmus was working in Venice as part of the League's uh, espionage operations during the League of Cambrai period of 1508. Um, Moore lectured for two years on St. Augustine's City of God between 1499 and 1501. So he was lecturing uh, completely on the City of God. Um, he was also lecturing on Plato, on Cicero, just as Augustine was. So you can see there's a, a strong continuity that, that Moore is tapping into. He goes into public life. He decides, okay, I, I won't do the man monastic thing. I'm, I'm going to go into public life. He becomes a member of the parliament in 1504 under Henry the seventh. Um, he on, he ends up becoming the undersheriff of London after uh, the league of Cambrai starts really falling apart. Um, he's now the undersheriff of London. Um, he ends up becoming the speaker of the house, uh, in 1522. And this is something which is, I mean, he's 
an advocate of the right of conscience to speak your mind. So even if you're going to say something which will anger King Henry the Seventh, um, he's saying and this is his first opening speech as the the Speaker of the House of Commons. It's in all of our right to to speak what we think or to withhold to not speak if we don't feel that it's useful to say um, our thoughts. Right, the the right to remain silent. That was not take. That was not something that should be taken for granted in those days. Most people would just flatter or say whatever was going to get them riches or or keep them alive or whatever. Um, but his view of governance was very different. He also was of the view openly that a, that true uh, law was defined by the consent of the governed, which again is not a very popular thing to say when you have a rule only by the d- divine rights of kings. But he was still open with that, and his honesty earned him a reputation. To the point that Henry VIII um, actually respected him and and promoted him consistently. And Henry VIII, the problem was he was not his father's son in many ways. He had a great classical education. He spoke many languages, but he had a gigantic flaming ego, um, which was recognized early on by the Venetian agents within the court um, at the time. People like later on Thomas Cromwell seems C- Cardinal uh, Wolseley was a was a part of this uh, inner Venetian agent network within the uh, within the courts of England, and his uh, his his ego was inflamed. He he loved being around flatterers, even though he respected more and 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 trusted him for the most part. Um, and Moore was really trying hard to keep th- keep the ship sailing. Right, um, wars were waging all across. Um, Europe, like Venice was, was really getting on track. They had by this time created in 1525, a new alliance called the Holy League of Cognac. Um, This involved the focus of the sacking of Rome, the creating of a league, um, which would involve Florence and Milan and um, the papal states working with Venice and France all of a sudden now. uh, And, and England had a sort of alliance with that to destroy the Spanish Habsburgs. Of Charles V. Instead, what happened is that Venice sabotaged it from within, ensured that one of their uh, their agents, who was the head of, Ge- who became the head of Genoa, um, whose name I'm forgetting, ran, took control of all of the the French fleets. The French somehow trusted this guy, and he defected while he was in control of the, of the French fleets. He defected to Spain, to Charles V, and left everybody else out hanging, so that everyone else was annihilated again. The Renaissance period at this point, the Renaissance dynamic really suffered a fatal blow. And uh, and Venice was the only one that came out unscathed. Every Everyone else took a hit, but Venice, in, if anything, they increased their possessions. While uh, Rome was completely sacked, the Medicis, who had still had the inf- their influence in Rome, a Medici was at that time the Pope, um, ended up getting sabotaged. They were taken out of power. They never got their power back. All of the their projects that they were investing in with their you know, their uh, financial operations were all canceled. And um, Charles V became the Holy Roman Emperor. And at this time, you know, Christianity is schisming too, right? So this idea, this hope of having a golden age of of, of Christianity, the way Charlemagne had been trying and and, and had failed. This was what Erasmus and all of these great humanists were were trying to do was purge the the Christian church of all of its treacherous, satanic, pseudo-Christian movements and, and bring about a true Christian um, organizing principle, the way Cusa had put into motion. This is what Thomas More was fighting for, and this is how to understand the utopia. Because at this moment, th- th- this, this dream was, was falling apart. So not only were the, the political alliances dividing, but also Christianity itself was becoming splintered and splintered and splintered into subgroups of warring inner factions, right? Starting with, with Martin Luther, but then obviously continuing on um, to include Calvin, John Calvin, also having his own sect. And then you had from there, um, radicals taking control of the Catholic church to control a pushback to destroy and just crush and kill, uh, the, pro- the Protestants who had very good rights to grieve on many points of their, their protestations. However, people like Erasmus and more were not getting on board because they had a more principled way of dealing with this corruption of selling indulgences and other things. Um, We're going to say more about that. But first, let's just get on to Thomas More. So inside of the Utopia, he's writing this, keep in mind, in the Netherlands in 1516. He's writing Utopia as sort of his city of God. It's his 
Plato's Republic. It's his Cicero's Commonwealth that he's doing, but now adding an element of what didn't exist in those previous times, which is physical economy, which becomes a more driving fo focus. And it's written in two small books. The first one, a platonic dialogue, diagnosing a lot of the problems of the, the system of British law. And the second part going through this fictitious um, uh, community, this republic in the new world that a, a character that, that Thomas More invents, um, uh, Raphael Heitlode, um, he's, the, he's this voyaging character who'd spent five years in Utopia, um, comes back and tells the story of what this world looked like as a way to sort of get across, kind of like what Plato does, um, a blueprint of a world where you're trying to aim for what is justice. But at the same time, just like Plato, there are certain thought experiments uh, and traps and that, that Thomas More is setting into his system for people to think about. So in the first part, I've got a few quotes here, and then we'll, we'll sort of wrap it up. So Thomas More writes, um, describing, I think this is Raphael now speaking, um, describing the, uh, the corruption of, of Europe and specifically Britain, uh, where he says, cast out these pernicious abominations. Uh, that's, that's the, the oligarch. He's basically describing the oligarchical practice of wealth extraction um, and exploitation of the poor. He says, make a law that they who destroyed farms and towns of husbandry shall re-edify them or else yield and uprender the possession thereof to such as will go to the cost of building them anew. Suffer not these rich men to buy up all to engross and forestall and with their monopoly to keep the market alone as, they, as pleases them. This is what Charlemagne was intervening on. So basically, in, in, he's, he's going through how you could cure the problem of the monopolies, these private corporations in, that were uh, cornering the market, that were artificially increasing the price of wool or whatever commodity by withholding their supply or killing their livestock, as is a common practice today, as was then the case. And he's saying, just pass, like, get, get on that, you know? And uh, if people are letting their, their, um, their possessions fall into disarray, force them, make laws that force these uh, rich, powerful uh, families and, and corporations to uh, re-edify them. So to, uh, it, you know, reinvest back into your, your possessions, your territories, or um, build them anew, build better things. If you're letting things go into, into disarray, your farms, your infrastructure. Can't really see the uh, top part of this, so I'm gonna have to make it smaller. Now, <clears throat> just quickly too, I would just say one thing that's uh, useful is he points out also in this the uh, the problem of um, utilizing mercenaries, like having a war economy, where he's like, look, all of the problem of poverty of people stealing, it's coming from the fact that we they don't have skills and they don't have a purpose to life. We have all of these mercenaries who only know how to kill, but when we're at at peace. They've got no way to earn a living except to steal or to create banditry. And then what, what are we doing? But then we punish them with death, which is the same punishment you, you basically, whether you steal something or kill somebody, it's death. It, it, this is absurd. Um, he says here, the and, and this is where he describes here, specifically intervenes on this absurd idea that you could use the same scales of justice to measure a human life with money or something less, you know, which is the way that that these artificial laws were being deployed to the, to the destruction morally of the citizen, the society that was deploying them, right? Killing people, uh, or, or, you know, who steal some bread or something. So he says, this punishment of thieves passes the limits of justice and is also very hurtful to the Commonwealth for it is too extreme and cruel a punishment for theft, yet not so sufficient to refrain and withhold, withhold men from theft. For simple theft is not so great an offense that it ought to be punished with death. Neither is there any punishment so horrible that it can stop those from stealing who have no other craft by which to earn their living. In this point, both you and most of the world are like evil schoolmasters who are readier to beat, the, beat than to teach their scholars. It were preferred that provisions should have been made that there were some means, by, means whereby they might make their living. 
so that no man should be driven to this extreme necessity, first to steal and then to die. There be handicrafts, there is husbandry, which is farming, uh, to get their living by, if they would not uh, willingly be not. So this is this is extremely important, and he and he goes through again the different types of crafts, the gills, the training, the schooling uh, that you could do to create a society where you don't have criminals, you don't have people who are just lethargic, uh, wasting away, you know. Um, and it's a it's a very strong uh, assessment of the, the the what is causing the undoing of the economy, of just having a useless class, you know, like like Yuval Harari says. <laughs> um, the, what do we do with the global useless class? Well, if you're Yuval Harari or somebody who you were like of that Davos crowd group, the solution is probably, well, let's just, you know, cull the herd. Let's just, you know, make fewer people. <laughs> That's one way to have peace and get rid of useless, uh, useless people is kill them. The other way is to make useless people become useful. How do you do that? You give them a reason to live and training and the means to develop their powers and talents. That's another option. That one takes more work. So oligarchs who are lazy don't like that. But all that to say, Thomas More is very strong on this. And you know, he appeals. This is now Thomas More speaking in the first person to Raphael, saying, Friend Raphael, you know, your wisdom is, is strong here. He's like, I believe that if you were disposed and found in your heart to follow some prince's court, the Commonwealth could be greatly helped by your good counsels. He's like, you should be a philosopher king. You know, you, you, this is the thing, or, or at least a, a philosopher, prince, a counselor. Wherefore, there is nothing more appertaining to your duty, that is to say, the duty of a good man. For whereas your, your Plato judged that republics shall by this means attain perfect, perfect felicity, either if philosophers become kings or else if kings give themselves to the study of philosophy. Again, very clear where Thomas More uh, stands in this. And, uh, and Raphael basically says, you know, I, I, uh, I probably can't, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't get along pretty well, uh, very well. I wouldn't be accepted in, in courts, uh, being what they are these days. But, it, but anyway, I, I think there's actually still Thomas More still speaking. And he says, here I say, where so great and high matters be in consultation, where so many noble and wise men counselor king only to war, here, if I, silly man, oh, I can't expand my screen because I can't, I can't read the, word, the words. Sorry, I was, yeah. Um, here, if I, silly man, should rise up and will them to turn over the leaf and learn a new lesson, saying that my counsel is not to meddle with Italy, but to tarry it still at home, that the kingdom of France alone is almost greater than that it may be governed by of, of one man, so that the king should not need to study how to get more land, but to govern well that land, which he already has. So, I mean, Thomas More is giving a direct message, right, to King Henry VII and any other uh, person in power reading this in all time, saying, like, why expand your land by conquering when you haven't learned how to just govern your own land properly? That was the basis of the, of the dispute between Stalin and Trotsky, right? Trotsky wanted to have global revolution, global war, global revolution. And Stalin was like, no, let's just figure out how to do this. We, you know, make an economy work in one country first. And then we could like talk later. But I mean, let's just, let's just clean up our own backyard. And that was the, the cause of that schism um, where Trotsky gets expelled and, and what have you. But we see the, these, these uh, principled fights replicating themselves throughout history all over the place. But the idea of just Figure out how whatever your doctrine of, of economics you want to call it, just try to figure out how can you make people happy, get rid of hunger, get rid of, you know, like what FDR called the four freedoms, right? Get rid of the freedom of want, the freedom of the fear of secret police, get rid of the fear of, uh, of war. Like actually work on developing an economy that does those things. It doesn't matter what you might call it. If it does those things, it is operating on, on a point of principle, right? Um, that's the key. Don't, don't try to go outside and just make more territory for your ego or for people, uh, you know, trying to advise you to self-destruct. So now he shifts gears into book two, uh, thinking about now, this is Raphael describing now the, uh, the utopians, which is a society where, you know, there's no, there's no, like people don't have uh, possessions. This is why Thomas More is celebrated as by, by many communists as being the first communist, but he's not really because Thomas More 
personally didn't believe that. Uh, he himself, you know, was a was a landowner. He liked the finer things in life. He helped other people. He helped uh, entrepreneurs all over Europe uh, or England. Um, but the point is, it's it's a it's a thought experiment, right? Like, what is the cause of our of our corruption? Is it is it money? Is it the love of money? Is it the love of possessions? He, these are thought experiments. You have to work through them. But he basically constructs, like Plato does, a land of 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 peace as much as possible, right? With a lot of good nuggets and a lot of other things inside, but it's interesting. But he, Raphael, after again, four years of living with the utopians, he says, when I reflect, which is by the way, a place literally that's set in South America, the, the new world had just opened up 20 years or 25 years before this was written, right? 1491, that was when the new world was discovered. And so there was already an idea of civilizing or, or bringing uh, a new type of civilization liberated from the oligarchical system of corruption and rot of Europe, far enough away from the old Europe into a new relatively pure blank slate. I mean, obviously there's people living there, but I mean, the point being was the, uh, the idea of creating and constructing uh, a just society was already alive uh, at this moment. It was alive even with Cusa before the new world was discovered. That was the idea um, that was at the heart of the American revolution. So, he says here, Raphael, when I reflect on the wise and good constitution of the utopians, among whom all things are so well governed and with so few laws, where virtue hath its due reward, and yet there is such an equality that every man lives in plenty. When I compare with them so many other nations that are still making new laws and yet can never bring their constitution to a right regulation, where notwithstanding everyone has his property, yet all the laws that can invent, that they can invent, have not the power either to obtain or preserve it, or even to enable men certainly to distinguish what is their own from what is another's, of which the many lawsuits that every day break out and are eternally depending give too plain a demonstration. When I say I balance all these things in my thoughts, I grow more favorable to Plato and do not wonder that he resolved not to make any laws for such as would not submit to a community of all things. For so wise a man could not but foresee that the settling of said this right, that the setting all upon a level was the only way to make a nation happy. Now, the question is, is this a level is, is this a material common level of equality? Or what is Plato's idea of equality? What is more in Augustine's idea of equality? Right? If you were just thinking on a purely materialistic level, you'd be like, let's make everybody equal, right? That's, that's sort of the, 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 um, the Klaus Schwab, I guess, idea, the great reset idea of you'll own nothing and be happy, right? We'll all be equal in this new type of communistic type of world of, of, of everybody being equally poor, eating bugs equally, unless you're part of the upper crust of, of shadow controllers in, you know, controlling the shadows in the, in Plato's cave. In that case, then you get to own everything um, and live as a hedonist with no laws. But otherwise, yeah. Um, so is that equality or is equality something else? Is, is equality more uh, based on a metaphysical principle? And that's, again, one of the challenges that weaves its way through all of the writings of Plato to Cicero to Augustine to Dante to uh, Thomas More. So describing here the... the, the um, one of the great things about the utopians is there's this the economy he's going really through the the quality of the the economic paradigm and he says with everyone practicing useful crafts and fewer men needed for each because the more people do something useful right the more you have a division of labor but the more productive people are so you don't need as many people doing the same thing um you have new things like inventions new type of technologies new type of like early industries are coming online so there is a fewer men needed for each as there is a great abundance of supplies occasionally they lead out a huge crowd to repair the public roads if any are worn away very often not even such work is required and so they make a public announcement of fewer working hours for the magistrates do not ex exercise the citizens against their will in unnecessary work since the institution of the republic has this one chief aim that as far as public necessity allows, all citizens should be given as much time as possible away from bodily service for the freedom and cultivation of the mind. 
for there, I think, lies happiness in life. Which again now gets us at the question of like, well, what is true happiness? What is true pleasure, right? Can you have a society where everybody has free will and yet uh, desires to do what is good? Or is duty something that you always have to suppress your desire to be a hedonist? Is there always gonna be an antagonism between the two? So obviously more is of the view, and I, I think everybody here is, is, is of the view, um, I hope, maybe not, that the high, that there are pleasures of the body, the pleasures of the, the flesh, but those are not the, the durable, uh, substantial pleasures, that there's a higher set of pleasures that come from the acts of using your mind in a, in a, in a mobile way, right? Making discoveries, which is a, is a higher transcendental quality of pleasure and sharing and giving your discoveries, learning new, right, from new people. And the idea of making things better for what comes after you. These are things that are beyond the flesh, beyond the senses. But a more durable pleasure can, can really come of that if you think about the health of your soul or the sickness of your soul by giving into uh, too many passions that make you a worse person or make others worse people. So <clears throat> this, he zeroes in on that. And I think the idea of the Declaration of Independence also should spring to mind here too, right? Because a lot of people have a superficial idea of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And they think of happiness as being, well, to do whatever you want, to make whatever you want happy. You know, I could be a, uh, I could sell drugs. It'll make me happy. I could do whatever I want. Is that real happiness as it was con conceptualized by Ben Franklin and, and those who, who had been the founders of the American Republic? Not a chance. No, I mean, for the most part, there was this higher idea of life and liberty being happiness, things that cause a higher quality of happiness. That's more than like chocolate cake or earning money. So now he describes here a little bit more of like, what is the, these aren't necessarily Christians in utopia, but what, what type of religion are they? And keep in mind, more is slandered today for being a Christian fanatic. Um, there's a lot of slanders against these people and, and you'll find them on Netflix or on, uh, on films. If, if basically they're, if Netflix or Amazon prime has made a movie uh, or a show series about something of historical specificity that deals with Venice or or the courts of uh, England or anything like that, you could probably, it's a fair guess, you'd probably be right that the very opposite of whatever they're saying is is true. And, uh, and um, that's certainly the case for the films and, and shows about Thomas that feature Thomas More in the courts of, of England, um, who again, treat him like a fanatic or whatever. Not the case. The utopians who are much more elevated morally than the uh, the European Christians or the, the English Christians who he's dealing with, Anglicanism hasn't come, come about yet, right? Um, the Henry VIII has not yet broken off ties with the cat with the church. So they're still more unified, uh, but it's still, he's saying that these non-Christian utopians are more morally and intellectually advanced. He even said that the Persians of the time are more morally and intellectually advanced um, in terms of how they treat their criminals, how they rehabilitate, then um, our barbaric practices in Europe. Um, so saying, okay, but what, what are their principles? What are, the, what, are, what are those things? So he says, these are their religious principles, that the soul of man is immortal and that God of his goodness has de designated that it should be happy and that he has therefore appointed rewards for good and virtuous actions and punishments for vice. Though these principles of religion are conveyed down among them by tradition, they think that even reason itself determines a man to be to believe and acknowledge them and freely confess that if these were taken away, no man would be so insensible as not to seek after pleasure by all possible means, lawful or unlawful, using only this caution, that a lesser pleasure might not stand in the way of a greater and that no pleasure ought to be pursued that should draw a great deal of pain after it. This is Plato's uh, Philebus dialogue. This is Augustine, right? How do you define true pleasure from fictitious shadow pleasure? Well, true pleasure is self-sustaining. A pleasure should never cause a pain if it's true pleasure, right? Whereas the pleasure you get from eating um, all you can eat buffet is pleasurable, but I know from experience, it causes pain, both the pain of the body, I eat too much, and the pain of regret. The next day, I wish I didn't do that, you know? So real pleasure is something that you cannot have too much of. It's not a quantitative 
uh, category. You can't have too much justice. You can't have too much discovery, right? You can't get full and bloated off of making discoveries um, or sharing. So that's that's you know one of the the key litmus tests he puts out there as part of the 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 principles of a durable, reasonable religion. I got two more. Yeah, okay, so two more. <clears throat> they reckon up several sorts of pleasures, which they call true ones. Some belong to the body and others to the mind. The pleasures of the mind lie in knowledge and in that delight which the contemplation of truth carries with it, to which they add the joyful reflections on a well-spent life, on the assured hopes of a future happiness. They divide the pleasures of the body into two sorts. The one is that which gives our senses some real delight and is performed either by recruiting nature and supplying those parts which feed the internal heat of life by eating and drinking, or when nature is eased of any surcharge that oppresses it when we are relieved of, from sudden pain or that which arises from satisfying the appetite which nature has wisely given to lead us to the propagation of the species. There is another kind of pleasure that arises neither from our receiving what the body requires, nor it's being relieved when overcharged, which is again, the pleasures of the more and less, right? Of, of having, needing to receive something or needing to alleviate yourself of something, both of which can be overdone, right? You can have too much uh, drink, too much food input, or uh, you could be, you could lose too much of something as well. Um, so the other kind of pleasure, um, by a secret unseen virtue affects the senses, raises the passions and strikes the mind with generous impressions. And that is the pleasure that arises from music. So again, now it's the artistic pleasures, right? These are, this is another spiritual set of pleasures, which is more than the bodily pleasures, but it's still a pleasure, but it's not quite intrinsically virtuous because you don't have to be a good person to like music, but it's still, it's like an intermediary between uh, the divine. He says, they do not pretend, this is the, the utopians, that happiness exists in every pleasure, but rather in what is good and decent. Virtue draws our nature to these as its highest good, though another school of thought feels that virtue is its own reward. So he's even saying like they got disputes in utopia too, right? Um, but this is a pretty healthy dispute. <laughs> is virtue is it its own reward or is, it, is there a reward itself for, for doing things of the highest good? That's, that's a healthy debate. Um, not, is there truth? You know, how many truths are there? <laughs> are there eight, are there 18 dimensions that justify string theory in the big bang, or are there 32 dimensions that justify how many multiverses are there? Right. Are there infinite? Are there a thousand, a billion, right? Cause you could, you could go on forever. It's like the, the, the academics or the scholastics arguing over how many angels can, can dance on the pinhead of, of a needle, which is the Aristotelian sort of Padua university style of, of argumentation which is really everywhere today. We don't argue about angels and pinheads, we, we, or pin, pins and needles. We argue instead about multiverses and, uh, and string theory and other quasi pseudosciences that are not really sciences when you get to the heart of it. Um, so he says here, uh, the virtuous life is, consist is consonant with nature who allows reason to master his passions. Reason first enkindles in us mortals love and adoration of the divine majesty to whom we owe what we are and what we ever will be. Secondly, reason shows us the possibility of and excites in us the desire for leading a life that allows the least anxiety and the greatest happiness for ourselves, a life dedicated to mutual help. Which again, returns back to this constant principle within the book of Matthew that Augustine cites that even Plato talks about without saying the book of Matthew because it didn't exist yet, of loving God and loving your fellow man, right? If you could do those things, as, as Jesus had, had uh, recommended, then all of the other commandments, all of the other Kantian do's and don'ts will fall into place. You just have to love God, love your fellow man. And, and that's at the heart of what differentiates a philosopher, a true philosopher, who, who's courageous enough and loving enough to go back into the cave from the, the sophist, the person who just professes wisdom, but doesn't have any substance because he doesn't really love people who wants to stay outside of the cave and simply, if anything, control the shadows to have more power, which is the, I think you get at the heart of the, 
Venetian oligarchical modality, right? The, the Babylonian priesthood modality that wants to control the mystery cults, the mystery schools, the, the different uh, satanic um, networks that people can sacrifice to, uh, you know, dance to, have sex to, whatever, but it's ultimately controlled by a, a priesthood, like, again, a wannabe priest like Yuval Harari, who talks about how we're going to be able to use things like meta, the metaverse, virtual reality, and drugs um, to keep people complacent in the global useless class. That's the other way. Um, his way of saying, like the, the actual Charlemagne, what we're getting at here is that, no, we, if we have to really love God, love our fellow man, and in so doing, learn to love ourselves in the right way um, and act accordingly. And when you do, then that's the foundation upon which a, a proper durable philosophy can be built, regardless of whether you're Buddhist, Hindu, Christian, Jew, Muslim, whatever. Um, and all that to say, so Thomas More was somebody who, um, you know, let me just end, I'll just stop sure. Thomas More was somebody who, in his life, he rose to become the high chancellor of England, right, by 1530. He uh, didn't last very long in that position, mind you. He did end his days with his head cut off. Why? Well, I mean, on the one hand, he was, ex just to get across, he was not a, a Christian fanatic uh, who was out just killing uh, Protestants, as, as is being slandered. If you actually, I tried looking for this, because a lot of people would always tell me, oh, yeah, Thomas More, he was a, a fanatic who uh, presided over thousands of people being burned at the stake for being Lutherans or whatever. No, there is literally the best evidence you have is that six people under the time that he was Lord Chancellor died, were burned at the stake for um, uh, uh, heresy in Protestantism or, or some other sub branch, because there were many branches, right? Of those, they say that there is conjectural evidence that he might have been responsible in some way for three of the six. Of the three of the six, there's actually no evidence when you when you look for it beyond hearsay of his enemies who wrote these books right after he died saying that he did these things, but there's no evidence anywhere that, that, that he did any of those things. And he even said in his apologia when he was in the Tower of London waiting to have his head cut off, um, he wrote several beautiful writings, one of which is the apologia going through that these are fake slanders. This is not verifiable for posterity. Uh, he wrote a platonic dialogue as well on the nature of duty and pleasure. And, uh, and well, he wrote a lot of things. But one of the things like, well, what was he doing? He was trying to, with Erasmus and again, with these other humanists, John Fisher was another person who also uh, was beheaded along with him and, and hundreds of monks who didn't want to support King uh, Henry VIII's um, declaring of himself the head of the Church of England um, were, were tortured to death, you know, uh, drawn quartered. Uh, before having their heads cut off. Um, so what was behind this? Well, this was a whole operation run by, uh, there, there's some work by Jerry Rose that I've read, um, a, a historian, which I'll put in the link to the description box, of the founder of modern Rosicrucianism, Francesco Zorzi, who was a Venetian monk who was brought in to be the advisor of Henry VIII, um, who really, he was a bit of a sexaholic. And, and this guy revved his engine, got him, got all sorts of ideas in, your, in his head that he could um, divorce Catherine of Aragon, which was at the base of a diplomatic maneuver to keep England and uh, Spain from going to war with each other. That was an important alliance because these were two maritime powers that both threatened Venice and Genoa, right? The England-Spanish relationship as well as France, but these were the two big ones. So Catherine of Aragon had to go. And so rather than getting a divorce, which there, there were precedents, by the way, for, for kings to divorce uh, their wives for various reasons. That had happened on several occasions. King Henry VIII could have done that, but instead of doing that, he went with this other thing, which was proposed by uh, Francesco Zorzi, who again, like I said, founder of modern Rosicrucianism in England, the, the dark arts of the occult. Um, his, his followers, people like John Dee later on, uh, Robert Flood, uh, who was an enemy of Kepler, um, who all were part of this court intrigue that that brought England more and more into a state where it became a vassal and then um, a host for the parasite. But he convinced them to just know you you need to um, bypass the Pope, declare yourself the head of the church, and then you could have your divorce. And you got you have to get everybody in England with a bit of a, anybody who has a bit of authority to submit 
to the recognition that um, you are the superior, the supreme head of the church, um, which is why today the Anglican church has this weird thing where the queen is the head of the church. She's like the Pope. Um, it's a, it's a theocracy in that sense, as well as an oligarchy. So <clears throat> this is what Thomas More. it's not like he resisted this. There were some who did resist, like these monks who got tortured to death. Thomas More said, no, I'm not even going to resist this. I'm just simply not going to show up to the wedding. And uh, I'm going to resign because I cannot be a part of this, but I'm going to keep my mouth shut out of respect. Good luck to you. He wished them their best. And um, that wasn't enough for Henry VIII. He wanted more. And, uh, and people like um, Thomas Cromwell, Thomas More's arch enemy um, played a key role in not just initiating getting Zorzi into the court uh, close to Henry VIII, but also initiated in getting Thomas More killed. First by, um, well, give, launching false accusations because they had court, they basically did what they did to Socrates, right? They had a court case, a sham court case, blaming Socrates for all of these things that he had nothing to do with, um, with false witness testimony from Miletus and Anatus and others who were part of the, 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 the Delph, you know, they're part of the, the oligarchical uh, takeover of, of Athens. Um, Socrates stood his ground. He, he, maintained, he kept his principles intact. But um, Thomas More as well, had, there were months and months of proceedings where false accusations against him because he didn't do anything illegal. So how are you going to justify killing him when he didn't do anything illegal? And so Thomas Cromwell said, yeah, he's consorting with a witch. Um, that's why he should be beheaded. That fell through. There's no evidence of that. Uh, there was a bunch of things like this. And then finally, Thomas Cromwell got one of his assets, a guy named something rich, I forget, who was a high level courtier who basically said, yeah, yeah, I heard when Thomas More was in the Tower of London, I heard him mutter. He bragged to me personally that he believes that Henry VIII is a usurper. And uh, and he testified. And it and basically, Thomas More said, I've never met, this, like, I've never spoken to this guy. I, I've, all I know is that this guy hates me and has always hated me. I don't respect him either. And you're going to take his word for what I said in private somehow? I don't even think I ever met him in the tower. Um, and it didn't matter. They took him 15 minutes of, of jury delegation, or what do you call it? Jury, man, of the jury to go out and come back with a, a guilty uh, conclusion. And uh, he was, his, his new fate was sealed and, and his... Uh, his crime, his punishment was going to be having your head cut off. Deliberation. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and the man had class, you know, like I said, throughout the entire time, his uh, daughters appealed to him, his, his, his friends and everybody appealed to him, kind of like Socrates, his friends had appealed to Socrates saying, look, just simply renounce everything and, and, and say, you know, Henry VIII is the man. He's the supreme. That's all you have to do. And, uh, and he wouldn't do it. He couldn't allow the, the pain of his conscience to suffer that type of lie uh, because he knew that as soon as you allow that to happen, you're going to set into motion an already splintered, divided, uh, to be conquered, uh, fragile church, which is now being broken up into pseudo cults of pseudo Christian movements all over the place where now fighting each other, you have the rise again of the radical Catholic uh, uh, reactionaries who are setting up things like the, 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 the Council of Trent in the 1540s that goes on for 20 years, which um, basically calls for a violent crackdown of all Protestants. So that obviously creates this eye for an eye type mentality, right? Where, where Catholics are, 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 are persecuting Protestants, Protestants get the revenge, they're, they're organizing in anarchistic hordes, uh, committing acts that are often unjust against families and, and innocents, of the Catholic faith and then back and forth again. And that goes on all over Europe, right? Over such philosophical issues, like is it through uh, works or a purely acts of faith that we find salvation, right? Do we need God's grace or is it just through works that uh, our soul becomes better? And people like Thomas More are saying, or Erasmus or, or others are saying, wait a minute, why this is a fake debate both of these things go together, right? If you, if you believe in God and you love God and you love your fellow man, you will do good. Your, your good works will follow. Um, they're not, you don't have to have these ongoing bloodbath fights over like, no, just be good behavior, be a good behavior, um, feudal surf on a Catholic plantation and you'll go to heaven or just have faith and don't do good works. And then you'll go to heaven. Why, why, why do that? There's no point. It's a fake debate. 
but it was flamed. The fuel of that fire was just flamed and flamed and flamed. Um, and then beyond that, you know, then you have things like the Jesuit Counter Reformation. So from this whole process of insanity, now the Catholic Church, full of like purged of humanists, is full of reactionaries who are now saying, well, okay, we need a secret army, a disciplined army to protect the church, which comes out of where? A Spanish mercenary under Charles V, after the Venetians have worked with the Spanish to, to destroy their enemies, right, and get full control of, uh, of, uh, of Italy and beyond. All of a sudden now, <clears throat> within that territory, right after this happens, one of these psychopathic, uh, you know, Spanish mercenaries, Ignatius Loyola, who's injured, has an existential fit, wants to have a, you know, he wants to, to he becomes a beggar, traveling all over Europe for like 10 years, wants to like earn money to go to the, the Holy Land, finds himself in St. Mark's Square, begging in the rain at, at night, and some Venetian nobleman hears him out of his window in his luxury bedchambers and says, oh, I just had a vision that uh, an angel spoke to me asking me, why is it that I could sleep so soundly in my bed while a holy man is outside in the cold at night? And this, I forget his name now, but uh, this Venetian oligarch goes out of his house, brings in Ignatius Loyola, right? Uh, Webster Tarplay goes through this in his old 1980 campaign, or it's a really great article going through a lot of these stories. Uh, brings this guy in, sets him up within a week with the Doge of Venice having a meeting where the Doge now agrees to sponsor this guy's career in anything he wants. So now the Doge is providing Venetian money, Venetian boats to get this guy to the Holy Land, give him his, his experiences, where he comes out of this process by the end of the, the 1530s as this uh, founder of a new sect, right? This new Jesuit order utilizing these, these, these techniques of self-hypnosis and deconstruction, self-deconstruction through his meditations, where if you do it right, <laughs> uh, you could become convinced that black is white if your religious leader in the, in the chain of command deems it so, because that person being a general of the Jesuit order must be more holy than you and must be a, an instrument of God's will because he's holy, he's higher up than you are and giving you the orders. And so you don't have any obligation to think for yourself because who are you a worm that you are to impose your own judgment of no white is white and black is black. No. <laughs> and you have to believe it. Right. And you have to believe that you're not responsible for the crimes that you do with your own hands. If it is an order given to you by a holier uh, one from above. And that's how this whole weird uh, counter reformation thing was then created. Um, which various popes at different times tried to resist, you know, from the banishment of the, the Jesuits in 1773 by Clement the fourth, I think, um, who also died a mysterious death right afterwards to many popes, um, all the way to, to John Paul II, who tried to clamp down on this thing and, and, and was shot, you know, and never came out of it fully, uh, fully together in 81. So you get this whole thing. And, and meanwhile, this, this parasite, is working the courts of England, right? Moore is now dead. His, his allies are purged. Um, Nicholas Jones went through this beautiful story in his lecture not that long ago regarding Mary Stuart and the whole fight over, you know, the, who would control the courts of Elizabeth versus Mary. What about James, who was this Rosicrucian loving mystic occult uh, king who was brought in um, at a certain point in the early 1600s? Um, what was the takeover there? What about the 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 takeover of the of of Amsterdam, which had been a, a humanist republican beachhead against the Spanish ty tyranny of uh, of I guess it was Charles uh, the second, which Schiller exposes beautifully in his Don Carlos, and this becomes the zone where the the, the Venetian apparatus then moves primarily first to to smother any type of humanist republican cultural movements there, and then install the Bank of Amsterdam modeled on the Bank of Venice and uh, the Banco Ambrosiano of, of, of Venice, becoming the world's sort of first official private central bank, utilizing usury, speculation, and, and other things. Um, you have, uh, then that is replicated with the creation of the, the Bank of England, not that long, I mean, a while afterwards, after the Glorious Revolution, where it is described in Graham Lowry's book on how the nation was won, how the Venetian party took control. People like John Churchill, Lord of, 
of Marlborough, right, who was the head of the Venetian party of England, took control and, and facilitated the takeover of a puppet Dutch king, William of Orange, to be installed in the, uh, the seat of power in England. And with him came the empowerment of the city of London, the creation of the Dutch model Bank of England as the world's second private central bank. Um, the, the, I mean, so much evil came out of that. And despite it all, you still had Republican Erasmian Thomas More followers in positions of power, even at that late date, people like John Swift, Jonathan Swift, uh, Robert Harley, the prime minister who worked with Queen Anne, which again, if anybody hasn't read uh, Graham Lowry's book on how the nation was won, poof, it really goes through the, 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 the culmination of the British deep state, the, the transplantation of the Venetian parasite into the British Isles, which to this very day, still, I, as far as I could see, really still does remain with all of its different tentacles and fifth column operations in different parts of the world, including Wall Street, including the Middle East. Um, it still remains the power center with its cults, with maybe slightly different names, but you see more and more of that these days, right? When just looking at the Grammys, you could see certain aspects of these cult practices um, just on stage. Um, so all that to say, the point that I really hope that I got across here, I'm gonna end it here, is that the new Silk Road process, the Eurasian partnership, is not some phenomenon that has no precedent in history, although it has never taken the form that we see it today, especially not with 21st century technology, the atom and other things. Having these civilizational forces of, of Iran, Persia, India, uh, China, Russia, and many others getting on board with this other alternative to the mass depopulation, mass culling agenda is very important. And it's activating principles that were seen again and again in the best of the United States experience, all the way going back to the Monroe Doctrine and, and George Washington's call for a, a specific type of, of foreign policy that's based on win-win cooperation uh, and Ben Franklin's ideas, right? So th this is something which is part of a broader continuity. The oligarchy itself as well is not a new thing, right? The Great Reset is not something that just came about with Klaus Schwab and, and Klaus Schwab did not create anything. He's a lower order cardboard cutout, cut out, cardboard cutout. If it were not him, it were someone else. Um, this is part of a broader historical continuity that goes back to the deepest written records. And I'm sure far before that as well. Uh, maybe that's for future historians and anthropologists to dig out some of that deeper history, which I'm sure will even showcase more of this, this fight between this platonic humanist loving system and a loving idea of a God, a unifying creator that's reasonable and loving and good versus who, in whose image we are made versus this other conception of a cold, uh, evil creator in whose image we are made. Um, some might call it Lucifer, others might call it some other name, who knows? But point is, um, that is out of whack with reality. It's not long for this world. I don't think it's in harmony at all with even its own self-interest, because even whenever this parasite does get what it wants, what we see historically is its own self-destruction, as Augustine pointed out beautifully in the destruction of the Roman Empire. It was under its own uh, defiance of natural law that caused the Roman Empire to collapse. And when that collapse happened, the ruling families, the parasite didn't benefit by the collapse. Same, right? So this is the thing. It's it's it should give us a sense of hope and a sense of optimism in a sense, despite the fact that we are at a point like Augustine was of the end of a system which is precarious. And our personal, um, uh, what do you call it? Our personal comfort may be challenged in very deep ways. Spiritually, we may find ourselves and we are finding ourselves challenged. And this is not probably going to go away going into the coming months and years, but there is a higher function of principle at play. And that's very important. And I think that the oligarchy cannot win. They've created such a system of mediocrity embedded, right? Just look at, look at the type of political players they have put in positions of power. That's a lot of P's for one sentence. Um, I don't think that they've got a system that can compete with actual human beings who can think on that higher level and who are acting and thinking on that higher level as we speak. So ultimately that's my, that's my testament of hope. And uh, yeah, I'll just open up now for a little bit of, I, q and I know it went on for a while. I'm sorry about that, but I really wanted to make this a trilogy uh, in three three lectures. So if there's any questions, you can put your name in the chat box. I don't know if Cynthia or-, or... Uh, Matt, can you hear me? Okay, great. Oh, there you um, go. Uh, 
it's a uh, Stephen who's uh, first. Oh, hello. Hi, Matt. Thanks for another brilliant lecture. Uh, you know, the, the animation, the passion is there. You can feel it, and it's uh, it's contagious. It really is. Um, I have two questions. I'll just ask one, and I'll wait and get back in the queue for the second one in case there's time. Um, your concept of a parasite uh, really excites me because it kind of gets into something that I'm going to be talking about in two weeks from today uh, and the underlying nature of it and why it's progressing over time and, and what it really is. But um, I noticed that you kind of uh, lit up a bit when you mentioned the Kazarian Kaganate, but I didn't see the tie-in to the parasite explicitly. So did that Babylonian mystery school thing that seemed to have started off somehow go from Rome to Kazaria to Venice, or did the Kazarian entity fuse with the parasite? If there's That's a, a great question there. That's a great question. Um, no. Um, the, so here's the thing. Um, how's the best way to answer that? Because Kazaria, we're almost talking Ukraine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the Kazarian area occupies Crimea, a big chunk of uh, East Ukraine, a big chunk of southern Russia um, at its max. And um, so the thing I didn't say about Kazaria is that, um, okay, there's a few things about it. We don't have a, we have a lot of circumstantial evidence and, and other historians. There's a few historians who had written about it uh, while it was still existing. Al Masudi being one in his Meadows of Gold, who's a, an Islamic uh, geographer, and uh, Yehud Halevi in his uh, Kazarut, Kazari, also wrote about that as well around the 10th century. Um, we also have secondary or uh, firsthand um, documents from the uh, Genitsa archives that were recently discovered a few years ago in Egypt, or at least they were discovered in the 1890s, but people only started going through them in, in more recent years, which has documents from the Khazarian kingdom that, that people only, they didn't realize to what extent it was a Jewish kingdom until somewhat recently. Um, why it converted is up for a bit of speculation. It's somewhat apocryphal, um, but it was around 750 that it, that it converted. Before that, it was a Turkish um, like I said, it was a shamanistic system. There, there is a lot of evidence that the Turks, um, so the Turks had a pan uh, cultural East and West dimension, right? You had the Eastern Turkish around today's Turkmenistan on the coast of, uh, of India, uh, sorry, of, of China on the West around uh, um, West of Urumqi, uh, Xinjiang. And then you had obviously Turkey and, and you had branches all the way up until the, the West and into the North. And uh, they had married into like a, a Khazarian princess, married um, a Byzantine emperor. And uh, that's where you have Leo the, the Khazar, who's a Byzantine emperor, who's not a bad guy, who was who uh, the, the husband of the empress uh, Irene, who's actually also not a bad person, coexisting around the time of Charlemagne. They were both kind of working together at a certain point um, on also creating another dimension to this ecumenical alliance. It wasn't just Charlemagne. And, uh, and the Jews and the, the Muslims, but it was also with the Orthodox Church at the time of Constantinople. And so you have good and bad in, in a lot of places. Um, one of the dimensions of this is that after, um, so the, the, the Chinese emperor came into a crisis. This will play into our story in a second. The, there was an, an Angshi rebellion in uh, the early eighth century, right as the Silk Road was beginning. And it was a general that wanted to take control of, of China and bring it back into a, war, a warring status. Um, it, this, this civil war went on for many years and it was put down because the Muslims under the Abbasids devoted their army to helping the, the emperor uh, win. The, uh, the emperor was known up until the 760 or so as the heavenly Kagan. That's an interesting thing. Uh, so he was called by the, by the Turks, by the Khazars, the Heavenly Kagan. That was his sort of secondary name as his foreign policy. The, the territory was given, uh, to, a lot of territory was given to the Muslim soldiers to stay and live in China, which is why you have Muslims living in China today. China was also receiving Jews. So when the, the persecutions were still going on, the Byzantine kingdom was, was persecuting a lot of Jews at the time uh, with forced conversions. And one of the few places also, it wasn't safe to live in, in a lot of the Muslim territories and the beginning of, of the Islamic sort of rising 
Um, the, the place where they had no persecution was in China, which offered equal citizenship to, to everyone. And so Zoroastrians, Jews, Muslims, uh, Nestorian Christians were all finding safe haven in China, starting in 618 or so, right at the start of the Tang Dynasty. Very interesting process. Um, Khazar, Khazaria, so as I mentioned, they have the, the Muslim em, uh, armies who are defending them for about 80 years. They also have a Supreme Court system that manages all of the, the court cases, which is run by two Christians, two Jews, two Muslims, and one uh, pagan from Kiev Rus. And that, that is the court system. Um, so it's a really ecumenical system from the beginning. One of the other things about the, the Eastern um, or the, the, the pre-Jewish Khazars is that they, the principle of the mandate of heaven uh, was very strong in their philosophical uh, views. That, that man's law is only good if it conforms to the laws of heaven. Um, that's very much in conformity with the Christian principles too that we were discussing throughout this class. So the decision to, uh, to convert at, in 750 or so, as it's told by al-Masudi, uh, or no, sorry, it's told by Yehuda Halevi, took the form of, of King Bulan going to Baghdad. And in the, in the kingdom of Baghdad, um, he had a dialogue with representatives from each of the big three religions and did a platonic dialogue with each one and came to the conclusion that the one that's most in, in his interest and reason to, to join would be the Jewish one. Um, it also helped too that there was a lot of fights breaking out between the Christians and the Muslims. So, you know, if you were gonna maintain trade corridors on a geopolitical level, it would be just very, um, at the time, uh, prudent to have the, the, uh, the Jewish faith as that which would maintain the most neutrality. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that um, the, the center, because the, the Khazars are treated today as if it's a center of evil um, that gave birth to the Rothschilds and a lot of the leading Jewish bankers that are playing a big destructive role in today's world and have been since especially the 13th century. Um, so one of the explanatory models that's been put out there first by, I think it was David Icke, uh, but it, it, it sort of took on a life of its own, is that all of these bankers doing mercenary work uh, and doing destruction uh, have their origins in Khazaria. And they try to spin it as though from Babylon, you had the, the oligarchy of the Jews controlled Babylon. They took control of that. Then the Jews moved uh, to uh, Rome, took control of that. Rome was the victim, Babylon was the victim, and then the parasite took control of Khazaria. That became the center of evil. And then they took control of uh, Venice. And then, uh, and then, and then they did um, banking after the Crusades of usury and other things. I have seen in my research, looking at uh, the evidence of Pierre Baudry and, and many others and a lot of firsthand writings, uh, that is a total inversion of the truth. It's not, not true at all. Uh, what, what, what did happen is that Venice led in the creation of new anti-Jewish laws in the ninth century after the Charlemagne's empire had been totally dismantled. The Crusades were about to start and around the end of the 900s, the 10th century, is when the first laws in Venice were passed that forbade any ship to do business with Venice that was carrying a Jew on it. So no longer could you uh, be a Jew that was allowed to travel. You weren't allowed to even be a, a merchant. You couldn't, uh, laws were passed first in Venice again that you weren't allowed to, uh, to have a trade. You couldn't, you couldn't be a farmer. Uh, you couldn't be a soldier. You were not allowed to carry a sword. Um, so pretty much all of the typical domains where one would find work um, were, cu were cut off and they were only allowed to be like used cloth salesmen or uh, accountants and brokers for, uh, for financiers. They could do those things because in the Jewish faith, you're not typically forbidden from uh, doing usury, whereas in the Christian or Muslim faith, it's more clear that you're not supposed to. But so the question became for the, for the Venetians who are nominally maintaining the veneer of Christian, well, how do you do usury, which you have to do when you're not tip, when you have to maintain a Christian veneer? Well, let's use these Jews. So that's where the ghetto comes in. So the Venetian ghetto was the first word that the word ghetto came from is in Venice. Um, and they just absorbed and, and they ensured that these laws were also passed in Germany and in the Holy Roman Empire territories in France, uh, in England were passed them the same thing too. So pretty much just 
uh, deconstructed the Jewish cultural matrix in a really bad way. And then you had the phenomenon of the, the court Hof Juden, right? The, the court bankers that were deployed as mercenaries to carry out works on behalf of their overlords. Um, but the people who would receive the, the, in, the, the victimization by the usurious policies of the, the bankers who would be doing the work, the people on the receiving end of the pain would see the hand of their abuser and not the hand of who's, who's controlling your abuser. And so increasingly the Jews became the center of the, 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 the sink of hate, a very useful foil uh, for the oligarchy to always just have, you know, Jewish bankers did it, Jewish bankers did it, see? Sassoon's, Montefiore's, uh, Rothschild's, like there's a whole variety of these names and, and ultimately they're still beholden to a higher power. They're just used. And then there's lower ones like the, 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 the Bronfmans in Canada, right? That's a newer family brought in because there's, you know, Samuel Bronfman, Bronfman was a, a good sociopath, no access to his conscience, did his job well. He was granted a certain dynastic privilege, right? His kids will be taken care of as long as they maintain the family business. He was granted the, an, uh, he was inducted into the Knights of uh, the Order of Bath under the control of the crown uh, as a Freemasonic sort of, you know, you're inducted into the, to the higher clubs, you know, and, uh, and, and the thing rolls on, you know, the thing rolls on, but, uh, but it's really, uh, Kazaria seems to have been primarily a good thing. And again, the slavery thing is another one. People say, oh yeah, but Kazaria uh, by the ninth century was bartering in slaves as part of the slave trade. Yeah. Well, the, the entire, you know, Muslim world was as well. And, and a big chunk of Christian financial backers and everything were doing that too. Um, and it seems like at that point, Kazaria had lost a lot of its sovereignty and had become increasingly subverted by the Venetian uh, uh, financiers who had their fifth columns that they had embedded within Kazaria, right? They had even orchestrated attacks by pagans from the, um, from the east to increasingly take control of more of the, the Kazaria territory, so that, such that by the, the 11th century, there was nothing really remaining. So, oh, the other thing too is, is interesting is the earlier Jewish, like in, in Saudi Arabia and Yemen, it was recently just discovered that from 380, when Augustine writes or becomes a Christian, right? And when, when St. Patrick is, is being deployed by the Augustinians to go to Ireland, um, from 380 all the way until 500 in the domain of most of today's Saudi Arabia and Yemen, that was a, a Jewish kingdom of him, uh, him, Himartia. Hiamartia, I think is how it's pronounced. Jewish, right? That's, that's controversial. That's like the land of Mecca. And, and a lot of Muslims don't like admitting that, but this is before, before Islam was created. But like, why? Why did that kingdom decide to convert to become Jewish at that time, which was a big uh, screw you to, uh, to, at the time, the early Byzantine Eastern Empire that was trying to expand its territory into that zone, and it was blocked. Um, that's an interesting story. That was almost totally scrubbed out of history. And that was just recently discovered, I think, in the last five or six years. Um, so that also seems to have something to do with Augustine and, and Islam. You know, Augustine put forth a doctrine for the Christian church uh, called the Doctrine of Witness that took a lot of the, the, the wind out of the sails of those who were trying to persecute the Jews uh, for having killed Jesus. And that was like a big thing that Augustine was doing battle with. There was a lot of pseudo Christian cults and a lot of like low level thinkers who were getting very geopolitical and becoming puppets. And a big one was let's have a, a war against all pagans. Uh, and let's, a lot of that hate was directed towards the Jews. And Augustine intervened directly in his doctrine of the witness was like, no, it's not only our job to, uh, to not kill Jews, but even to protect Jews because their existence reconfirms as a proof uh, Christ's life, who was a Jew. Um, and then there was a, the Dini, that same doctrine was replicated in Islam uh, in the Abbasid dynasty by its scholars, which was the, the, the doctrine of Dini, which is again, the same thing that, you know, the, the, the Judaism is the, the, the root, the, the family of Abraham around which the Christianity and, and Islam sprang from. So we have to protect them too. Um, so it became um, an interesting philosophical system within the mix. The last thing I would say is on the Talmud, um, for anybody listening and they're like, oh, but I've seen sections from, from the Talmud that, that really are ugly and that say that, you know, uh, Gentile or um, 
um, what do you call it, non-Jews are like less than human and should be exterminated. I've seen those, those citations too. And I got to tell you, um, when you look at the Talmud, it's huge. It's literally hundreds of rabbis giving their opinion on the, the, on how to interpret the, the Torah and other things, but it's, it, it's not like, um, it's not like the Bible or the Quran. So when this is a difficult thing for Christians and Muslims, when they think about another faith is to project their own, uh, to, to look at it through the, the lens of their own faith. And it's like in the holy, the holy books of the Quran, and the Bible, it is treated like this is the literal word of God. Um, meaning you should follow whatever that is um, without question. You, you'd actually be um, foolish or sinful to try to question um, inconsistencies within these books. Okay. Within the Jewish worldview, the Talmud being is recognized not as the, the word of God. It's not where it's recognized as being the opinions of rabbis accumulated over time, which even in rabbinical schools, students are even encouraged in most, there are, there are branches of, of, uh, Judaism that appear to um, be more radical about this, but but for the most part, the students are encouraged to try to argue, to try to refute a lot of the, the things that are contained in the Talmud. Um, so it's recognized that it's written by human beings who have failures, and some of these human beings are bad human beings. And you'll find also, if you look in the Talmud works, a lot of very wise things as well. You'll find good things uh, that are just nuggets of wisdom. Um, and in, in the Quran and the Bible, uh, you'll find, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll, I might piss people off, but you'll find some, some ignorant stuff that could be abused by ignorant people to do damage and destruction to non-Christians non or non-Muslims, and that have done a lot of damage and justified a lot of damage. And you'll find a lot of good things and, and a lot of good wisdom, if you're, if you're sensitive to it, that'll make you a better person and, and bring about a, a better world. So there's that aspect of it too. And last thing, Got to look. Somebody has to take the time to look at the the Carthage Syrian alliance and the Roman uh, Egyptian alliance. I think to also get a handle on what was the uh, the role in the translation of some of the the Jewish Bible or the you know from the Old Testament um, around that time of that Third Punic War and also what was going on while the Jews were in confinement in Babylon. Right. What were yeah. how were the texts uh, affected during that time. What about you know? So there, there, there's things that have to be, I think, approached from a, a, the standpoint of a of a Schiller, a universal historian, uh, at some point soon. Thanks, Matt. Yep. Um, uh, Peter, you have a a bunch of questions. You can you can go ahead. Oh, you're muted. By the way, I think I'm unmuted. Thank you. Hmm. Well, good afternoon again, uh, Matthew. And the last part of your question may have uh, subsumed, um, last part of your answer may have subsumed the uh, part of my, my question, which was uh, what, what relationship, if any, existed between Jewish learned exiles with Venice during this time that you're, uh, you're addressing? And I had a... I'll, I'll leave it there. And I, I had another question, but it's, it's not quite as uh, pressing as that one. Mm. Mm. Well, I, I, it seems like Venice, um, there was within the Rosicrucian tradition specifically, um, the absorption of Kabbalism. And um, as part of as, as one of the tech or instruments used within the initiation process and indoctrination process of the, the mystery, the mystery religions, you know, or the mystery degrees, uh, that would take you, I think, closer and closer, uh, towards ultimately selling your soul and, and, and doing something terrible as part of a higher degree, um, of the occult, but the Kabbalah is big and, and it, it's there also in, uh, Scottish Rite Freemasonry. It's it's all like when, when Masonry is brought online, York Rite Masonry, Kabbalah is everywhere. And um, that is a that really did seem to in, get inflamed early on in, in Venice. Um, so 
I don't fully know all of the dynamics, but I, this is what I'm seeing. And one of the aspects I'm seeing with the Kabbalah, with the Sephra, the Einsof, uh, and the practices, the techniques of how to uh, relate to the Kabbalah, which I think also it, it ties into the growth of the, uh, what's that fanatical uh, Jabotinskyite group? Um, that's, that's um, oh, geez, it, it's big. I'm forgetting their name all of a sudden. Oh, God. Anyway, there, there's You're a thinking there's a, of a Hasidic group that uh, uh, is a part of that. With, yeah, but, yeah, that Kolomoskoy is a part of that uh, group. Um, the, the the Ukrainian billionaire. Um, yes, um, forgetting the name. Well, you, um, Lubavitchers, no. Yeah, um, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that whole sect was founded by a Kabbalist as well. That like people like Rabbi uh, Cook, who was part of the the same uh, Kabbalistic radical networks that uh, led the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin in 1995, who was trying to broker a peace deal between uh, Yasser Arafat and the Jew and the Jewish state. Um, that, th 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 this, this, um, this Chabad Lubovitch group, yeah, it's founded by, by a hardcore Kabbalist. They're, they're, they're always around yeah. the Jabotinskyite networks. It's, 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 organized as a secret society. Yeah, part of it is, is that you don't read the Torah. Here's, here's some of the absurdity, right? Here's how it works. You don't read the Torah to get ideas. You don't read it to try to make life lessons or learn something that you could, you could intelligibly think about and apply in your life. The way it's done is you treat the Kabbalah as if it's a bunch of just symbols and sounds. And simply by um, doing certain humming sounds, um, you, you basically break down the, the, the pages, the paragraphs, the, the sentences, and the words to, to the letters. So you're not thinking about the whole. You're just thinking about these little parts that become symbolic hullabaloo and utilizing certain techniques involving incense, a candle in a darkened room. You could put yourself in a bit of a trance state that involves going into um, – a guided experience that feels like a divine experience, but it's just the feeling of it. It's not the actual thing. And it seems to be a tweaking of the sorts of Babylonian witchcraft practices that were being practiced in uh, the, the cult of Marduk, um, for example, as part of the, the old mystery religions. Um, so that, that, and, you know, some drugs, hallucinogenics sometimes play a role, it seems, in this, in this experience. And you, you feel like now you're a different person after a set of, of Gnostic type experiences are placed in your path. And then you can go on to, to accept a new set of um, rituals that you would, maybe the former you would not have accepted going through that then brings you ever more into a state of dehumanization. Um, and you become more malleable as somebody who's being brought into the inner core, right? And, and then you're doing this and, and drinking baby blood uh, before you know it. So... <clears throat> The, uh, these groups often found themselves in Venice. Like Venice is the hub of a lot of these, these Jewish Kabbalists and these Rosicrucians like Francesco Zorzi, the marriage counselor to, uh, to Henry VIII, Kabbalist. Uh, Robert the Flood, the enemy of Kepler, Kabbalist. Um, John Dee, right? The, the, the guy operating like, kind of like a, an Ian Fleming, uh, running, running uh, secret Nutella operations in, in British courts, Kabbalists. So... Albert Pike, Kabbalists. So there's that. Um, also, you know, Venice had the biggest print printing presses, like I said, a near monopoly. Um, and they were just producing <clears throat> a lot of, of Babylonian uh, Talmud stuff, um, which was part of, it, it wasn't being printed to read. It was being done to fuel the networks of these different um, sects around the world. Um, that were then just creating new deep state fifth column operations in various parts of Europe. So, yeah, there's there's that. But it's it's something that it's difficult to uh, investigate. You kind of have to just make inferences from shadows and sometimes and just triangulate, you know, on the thing you're, you're searching for. I don't know that. Question, you know. Oh, I, I I do appreciate that. that, that yeah. You do. Uh, you do you do make some connections, and it, I've done a little bit of research. And yes, the the founder of uh, Lubav of uh, of the Lubavitch house uh, that was uh, they call him the Alter Rebbe uh, Schneur Zalman of Liadi, and he mm -hmm. was a uh, 
he was a uh, second generation disciple of the Baal Shem Tov and interesting, you know, created a dynasty. And the last of the Lubavitch dynasty was the was Menachem Mendel Schneerson, who uh, departed the life in uh, 1994. And he was the, the seventh. And interestingly, the, the fifth one, the Rebbe Rashab, as he's called, was anti-Zionist, but his two successors were pro-Zionist. So there was there was a, there was some of a difference. And you know, one thing that they do is the the third in the dynasty did uh, have a conflict with the uh, the Haskala or the the Jewish Enlightenment that that emerged out of Germany. So there's a, a piece of history there. But, hmm. uh, I I do appreciate yeah. it, and especially what you had to say about the Talmud, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I would think too. Uh, the, the thing to also keep in mind when you read, I'd really recommend reading um, some of the really awesome Jews. Like um, number one, Philo of Alexandria, who worked very closely with uh, Peter, the Apostle Peter in Rome. Um, he was the leading know. Platonist um, who was working to expose and fight these these uh, occult cults. Uh, in Rome uh, and his writings, especially on creation is so good. Uh, the other guy more recently would be Moses uh, Mendelssohn and his book, uh, Jerusalem, which I think you can get on archive.org is really great. And again, another Platonist, he, he translated a lot of Plato, the, the, he upgraded the Phaedo um, as well. And he was uh, a German, led the Yiddish Renaissance, but also was part of the networks of Lessing um, and, uh, and later on Schiller. And anyway, Mendelssohn's point, and, and a lot of these 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 Platonic, I would even call them Augustinian Jews, frankly, you know, like they they they're um, they're making the case that when you speak of the chosen people, it's not that it's an elitist thing. They're trying to say like you're chosen to be the first in morality. You have to be the the city on the hill type people. The way you know John Winthrop was saying, you know, we have to be the exemplar uh, to inspire and help others. You have to be the first in morality. And when a lot of these people were talking as well, especially in Germany of the, you know, a lot of these, these, these humanist uh, Jews, when they were talking about Zion as this promised land, it was very much more like a, it wasn't a blood and soil physical thing. They were not materialists. When you read their writings and it's again, Moses Mendelssohn's Jerusalem is a great writing. It's very clear that it's not a physical place. It's, it's more like this, this city of God, which Augustine says, you know, we're never going to get the city of God is, is, is a metaphysical uh, part of the superstructure of the universe. It's not something that we can physically as physical beings in space and time, we can never actualize that, but it's something that the mind and soul can use as a guide to, to self perfect in, in the, the realm of the becoming the lower state of, of reality, the higher state of reality where things are, are being, where they don't change, they're transcendental that's that's purely for the contemplative side but to guide right our actions and so that was the the idea of zion for a lot of these these renaissance jews it was like the the the, the society of of the philosopher kings and of justice that we have to bring about for all mankind so again it, it's it's not this jabotinskyite we want this physical greater israel zone right which which falls right into place of the of the geopoliticians that want to just manipulate ideological sects for geopolitical purposes to fight over territories, which is how it's it's been since the temple. You know, I think it was Justinian who promised to, uh, or is Di Diocletian, Diocletian, the father of Constantine. I think he was. Yeah, he tried, and, he, and there was a project. Yeah, yeah. In three sixty two C E, there was got the uh, recon the commencement of building the third temple was to take place, except there was an earthquake in Jerusalem and. And a lot of the folks uh, had a change of uh, heart, as I've yeah. read, as I've read history. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Stephen, you're next. Okay, I'll I'll try to be brief because I don't have too much time myself. Um, with regards to your comments on the first versus the fourth crusade, and to me, this brings to mind my, my lecture on Hapgood and the ancient sea kings and ancient maps and all that. Um, I've always had the sense that the first crusade, the real purpose, or probably hidden amongst other purposes, was the search for 
ancient knowledge, for lack of a better term, however one might define that. Uh, and it occurs to me that that would rationally explain the basis for the Fourth Crusade, because, uh, and, and I'm not particularly well versed in history, but would not Constantinople, Constantinople have been the recipient of what was not destroyed by the caliphates uh, when they took over the Library of Alexandria? So that uh, there could have been ancient texts, documents, maps, whatever there. Um, and that would explain under a facade, possibly, the, re the real goal always was to sack Constantinople. I mean, it would have been another thing, the wealth, the trade networks, of Venetian control, but you'd also arguably have access to these ancient uh, sources of knowledge treasure. Has there been any indication that that might have been a motivating factor? Or is that just an inference on my part that may have no validity? No, I mean, I, I think that... Um... Constantinople, after the Library of Alexandria was destroyed, um, for reasons I don't fully understand, but yeah, Constantinople had the most impressive library in the world. And a lot of that library, it, it, some of it probably grew out of the preservation of some of the texts uh, from the, the Library uh, of Alexandria before it was destroyed. Others uh, were definitely acquired by the, uh, the Muslims who had already a very advanced from the, uh, the Abbasid Renaissance, even from the Umayyads, I think, before the Umayyads were expelled from uh, the Middle East into, uh, into Spain um, in 750. They had already begun a, a process, but it really got underway under the Abbasid Renaissance of translations of ancient texts, the hunting down of Plato. A lot, or, or, actually, Plato wasn't really well known at the time. It was, he was tougher to find. But uh, a lot of the ancient uh, Greek and Roman texts were translated and preserved in the Arab libraries in Baghdad, and there was trade that were still underway, and the, the, the Byzantines were very interested in accumulating as much as they could, and the, the library at Constantinople became world-renowned as just the best of the best, and it was, uh, as far as I could tell, it was really, um, it, it took a big hit when, when after the Fourth Crusade, um, although the Venetians were not very interested in bringing back, they stole all of the, the, the text by Aristotle that they could get their hands on. And the, the sort of the, 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 the thinkers that were useful, the ancient thinkers who were useful for the maintenance of, of, of an evil empire, they were all absorbed, they were stolen, they were taken and, and used by Venice, but Venice left the Plato. I don't know why they didn't destroy the Plato at the time and, and other things, but anyway, that's, that's the way it worked out. And then about 50 years later, Venice orchestrates, um, oh, by the way, Venice got more money because they got a bribe from the, uh, the Ottomans and I think the head of Egypt, I forget who he was, a sultan, um, for, for deflecting the crusaders in the fourth crusade from, from going to the Holy Land and instead to get them to destroy Constantinople instead. So Venice got a lot of money. They got all of Const uh, Constantinople's territories or most of them. They got to the ch chop up Constant the Byzantine Empire into three smaller little states. And, uh, and they got a ton of money as a bribe from, uh, from uh, the, the ruler of Egypt, the Sultan. And um, By the way, Matt, um, Venice did uh, ban uh, the followers of Plato, such as Erasmus in the Librorium Prohibitorium thing that they enforced with the Catholic Church. Yeah, thank you. That was later, though, but that was right. Yeah, and the, with, the, with the Council of Trent... Yeah, they, they, which created after uh, Luther the uh, the the band the index of banned books of which yeah Plato and and Kepler was also banned later on, um, but but in twelve fifty something um, there was another invasion orchestrated by the uh, the, the Venetians utilizing um, the Ottomans who again really did a lot of damage to the dwindling remnants of the uh, the library and. Uh, and even though Constantinople somehow w was able to recover so that the, one of the, the smaller branches, which became the Nicene Empire, it's one of the, the, one of the three small sub uh, Byzantine structures, it was able to recover itself and recover the Byzantine Empire to a certain extent um, in 1261. But then when, the, when 1250 happened, so it, 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 that only lasted for another 200 years. And then by 12, uh, by, sorry, by 1450, sorry, 1450, getting my dates wrong here, 1454, uh, thereabouts, was when Venice orchestrated the final and last assault that finally did away with the Byzantine Empire forever. 
and totally destroyed the library and whatever existed within it. Um, and all of the, um, what are called the Paleologues. So jo Emperor John the Seventh Paleologue, who was the emperor of, of, uh, of uh, Constantinople at that time, he was, he was on board with Cusa's um, Council of Florence. And he, he even brought a delegation of, of 700 Orthodox uh, Christians to that delegation in Florence in 1438 or 1439 to try to reunify the church. And, uh, and it was over the filioque, over the idea, does the, does the spirit, does the Holy Ghost emanate from just the father or both the father and the son? And, you know, it sounds kind of superficial, maybe from some of us in the modern age, but it's really a, a deep philosophical idea. It's, it's, it's pretty, pretty uh, solid of, of a point of discussion. And the, the Western church, especially Cusa, the Augustinians were all the view that, no, the Trinity involves the, the spirit emanating from the father and the son. The uh, their Orthodox counterparts didn't agree with that. They were like, no, Jesus is divine, but the spirit only comes from the father, not through the son. And that was enough to create the schism or to justify the schism. And uh, John Paleolog, John the Seventh Paleolog, said, no, no, we can we can get around this. We the importance is to to unify and create a strong Christianity that's capable of doing battle with the forces of, of evil. And all of these people really understood the Venetian uh, Babylonian parasite. They all understood that very well when they were organizing this. And unfortunately, it didn't it didn't take hold, even though everybody agreed at the council. Uh, it didn't take hold in uh, back in Constantinople for some reason. And so it, it was only in Constantinople that you had um, the priests and bishops there agree to the filioque, but they were all killed in uh, 1452. Um, and there was, there was never really anything else that, uh, that came close to unifying the church under a principled way. You got the, the crappy version of it under Pope Francis right now, who's trying to unify all the, all the different branches under a new universal church, but without any principles whatsoever. If anything, it's principles of, you know, shamanistic Gaia worshiping cults, but uh, it's not really, I don't think the Russians currently want to have anything to do with that rightfully. No. no. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Uh, Matt, do you have a little bit more time? If uh, uh, I know Peter has, a, I think a few um, possible closing thoughts to share. Yeah. I'm unmuted. <laughs> Thanks again, Matt. I just, what was my, my last question? I, I had a, a posed a question that uh, what can we tell about uh, a community where one, where one, one uh, okay, here it is. What can I discern between an entity that names itself after St. Thomas Aquinas versus St. Thomas More? And here's a specific example of that. In St. Paul, Minnesota, the Archdiocese's university is named after Aquinas. And there is a large church on Summit and uh, Lexington Avenue named after St. Thomas More. And they actually renamed themselves from St. Luke's. And I added just a, a point of history. After the sacking of Constantinople and plastering St. Mark's Cathedral with Constantinople's mosaics, the lead prelate of Venice of the Roman Catholic Church is called the Patriarch of Venice to this day. Hmm. So what's, your, what's the question exactly? I, I, I didn't fully really get the question. I guess, I, I, the, I guess it's more of a question of musing or just philosophizing. If you had a, the, uni, the Archdiocese University here in St. Paul is named after Aquinas, but there's a community named after St. Thomas More. And I guess it, how would you draw a, a compare and contrast Aquinas and More? I guess oh, it's just an interesting I don't want to speak about something I'm, I'm not, I haven't studied thoroughly. I've read a little bit of Aquinas. Uh, I've read a lot more More. Um, okay. And um, I won't push you out that far. That's, yeah, I, I don't so, want to say anything. Uh, I might, yeah, I don't want to be sloppy with something like this. So I'm going to, yeah. yeah I'm gonna okay. Call, yeah. I'll plead the fifth. <laughs> well, everybody, yeah, I thank I, you very much. I, I hope I didn't, I didn't uh, draw on too long, but I, I noticed that I didn't lose too many people. So that's good. And uh, hopefully there's a, uh, 
I'm going to include a lot of uh, supplementary reading suggestions, including a couple of classes by Cynthia, which are just marvelous that touch on or elaborate upon some of the things that I only briefly touched upon. Um, and some uh, some online books you can find, including by Webster Tarplay, Lyndon LaRouche, um, Pierre Baudry, which I found to be of high use, high value, and Graham Lowry as well, um, and a few other things. So there's there's going to be homework for those who like homework, and for those who just want to listen to this again, I, I hope that this is listen. Uh, yeah, I hope that I've, I've given stuff that that is coherent and useful. I think you did a, a wonderful job, Matt. Um, so is it confirmed that uh, Alex Kreiner can uh, do something for, for next Sunday or that's- uh, Yeah, hold on, let me open up my calendar here. Next Sunday is the, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I could do next Sunday if required as originally planned. Let, let, me, let me contact Alex and I'll see. And I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll let you know in the next 24 hours, Stephen. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Matt. Okay. All right. Thanks, Matt, for such a, th that was a great lecture. I really enjoyed it. I learned so much. Cool. Well, thank you everybody for Same here. showing up. Okay. Yes, thank you. Yep. Yeah. Great. great. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, thank you, everyone. Matt. See you next Thanks, time. Matt. Great. Bye, everyone. See ya.